Okay, three, two, one. Hello, world! Welcome to the Inglorious Academy. It is Anthony here, and uh, I haven't been cutting my hair since before the academy started. So I must find a hairdresser, a hair cutter, anywhere. I don't know how. Anyway, um, I'm experimenting. I have been experimenting since last Wednesday. This new uh, feature that I discovered in OBS, which allows me to switch uh, easily between scenes, uh, depending on the screen that I'm showing. So um, when I'm looking at the browser, it should switch automatically to the coding scene, which I think it is. And the same goes with the with Visual Studio Code. Yep, looks like it's working. Whereas if I'm looking at the chat, any chat, just like, um, no, this is not working. This is still, okay. And what about this one? Yep, this is working. Okay, so the stream chat is going to show my face while the Discord is showing, yeah, the, the coding scene. That's fine, okay. Uh, I probably wanted to do that, <laughs> but I didn't remember it. So, it's the 6th of February. 2021 and we're still stuck with the JavaScript fundamentals but this is intended because as I already told you fundamentals are really fundamental and it's no problem if we iterate over and over on loops because loops are made for this purpose we have to iterate over them and also because loops are uh, at finally um, a part of the language that allows us to really do something with the language. We're not just learning the language. Now we're going to use the language. We are learning how to solve algorithms with this language. An algorithm is just a step-by-step -step solution to a problem. So loops are the fundamental part with which we can create an automated solution for the problems that we want to find. Hey, Sal, good morning to you. Um, don't see many people currently, but I believe that either you are there and it doesn't show or uh, yeah, I see Angelo. Okay. Yeah. I've got, I see Tina. I see owned. Yeah. There's Tiago. Okay. Everyone's here. Good morning. <laughs> okay. That's fine. So, um, last Saturday I gave you a lot of exercises and, uh, I hope that you weren't overwhelmed by the amount of exercises. You weren't supposed to do them all by today, uh, but of course, as much as you could. If you haven't done these exercises and you don't want to spoil the solution, then please stop me as soon as you want and tell me, no, no, please, I want to try this exercise by myself. Please give me one more week or uh, just wait for next Wednesday. And that's fine for me. Otherwise, I'm going to show pretty much every exercise. Last Wednesday, we were looking at all the tasks for the loops and they were quite a lot. And m most of the tasks were actually the same uh, exercises that I gave you as a homework. So um, not really interesting. For example, output even numbers in the loop or um, yeah, repeat until the input is correct, or even this infamous output prime numbers, which we haven't finished last Wednesday, and we're going to cover it today. Uh, so today we're going to iterate over loops, and only when, when once you really, really say that you got them, then we can move forward to other things. We will never get rid of loops. Uh, in fact, we'll, we will then combine them with functions, with arrays, with objects, so uh, loops are now part of our language, just like variables and uh, if else statements, etc. So don't worry, uh, but you have to have them understood by now. Otherwise, they are still part of your problem and they are not part of the solution. And we want them to be part of the solution. So I gave you so many homeworks and um, we can start with the grades because the grades are a homework that I gave you last Saturday. And then last Wednesday, I gave you some more homework, a lot of more homeworks. So the grades application was an application that asked the user for grades until the user cancels, and then calculates the average of all grades. The average is calculated in this way. And I already had 
multiple people solving this problem in multiple ways, multiple interesting ways. So let's have a look at those um, solutions. This is Angelo. Angelo decided to start with a counter and a sum of grades. And um, the first grade is gotten with the first prompt in here. And then while the grade, grade is greater than zero and the grade is less than seven, and it's less than seven because in Germany, that's how you do grades. They are from one to six, apparently. If there is a grade, so if the grade is greater than zero, probably, then I want to, um, to add, to accumulate the sum of grades with the current grade, and I'm going to increase the counter. The counter, in this case, will just take track of how many grades I got from the user. And this is important because at the end, I have to calculate the average as the sum of all grades divided by the counter. And inside of the while loop, we still have another prompt because I want to continue asking the user for the next grade. And then finally, I alert the average grade by using this other function that I never told you about. So good, uh, good finding, Angelo, which is all about formatting a number to a fixed number of digits. So fixed two, which means that uh, if it has more than two decimals, it will just show the two most significant decimals. So this solution is great. The only couple of things that I could say are, if there's an if inside, I would like to see some more indentation here. Otherwise, it doesn't, it's not really clear that these two statements are inside of the if. And also, I'm not really sure that we need this if. Are you sure that we really, really need this? What happens if I instead uh, remove it? So let's try this solution. Okay. So I'm going to paste Angela's solution here. And it says, enter your grade. I got a three, I got a five, I got a four, and that's it. So here I'm gonna put either zero or whatever. If I put zero, your average grade is four, because if I put three, four, and five, of course the average will be four. And uh, what if I instead do three, four, five, and then ask, same. And uh, so it looks like it's working, but do we really need this? Let's see. I'm going to comment out the if, and see what happens. So three, four, and five, and then zero works exactly the same. But what if I press ask? What if it's not a number? Three, four, five, and then ask. Yeah, still working. So I don't really know if we need this if, because you are already looking at a positive grade between zero and seven. So when you are inside of this while body, probably the grade is already greater than zero, is a positive number, and uh, it, well, it's different from zero at least. So you don't need to put this extra if. So this is the only thing that I would suggest. But anyway, great solution, Angelo. Really great solution. This is perfect. Um, then what do we have here? There's another another attempt by Angelo, who wanted to use the do while loop, which is not really common, but this seems like a good fit for, um, for, this, for this kind of problem, because the do while loop will ask for a number every time, and then check the condition. So it will start executing the body, and then check the condition, while the well, instead, the while loop, first check the condition, and then, in case, it executes the body at least once. So, using the do while loop seems like a, a, good, a, a good solution here, but the cool thing about the do while loop is that you don't need to prompt multiple times, and in that case, you can just prompt only once. So, since we see two prompts here, uh, the do while loop is executed gracefully, but it's not doing exactly, well, it's, it's not fitting the purpose uh, of the do while loop. I would probably say, let's not prompt the grade here. Let's leave it like this. 
and then we can probably move this line of code here. Let's see if it works. So we start with the, a variable that has an undefined value. And then the first thing that we do is to assign a value to grade two. And in that case, I'm going to sum the grade. I'm going to uh, increase the counter. I'm going to check if the grade is still a valid one. And then finally, if the grade is not a valid one, I'm going to calculate the average again as before. So why do I need to, to use this let grade two here? Can I just say let grade two like this? No, actually not, because I didn't tell you too much about this, but variables, especially those variables that are created with the let keyword or the, uh, or the const keyword, are local to the block of code they currently live on. So this is a block which is delimited by curly braces. And if I declare let grade is equal to prompt, et cetera, et cetera, this variable will not be available outside of this block. So since we need grade two to be available in the while condition, we need this grade to be declared outside of the block and not inside. Because this way, the variable, yeah, starts undefined, then it's changes its value in the block of the do while, but then the grade is still available at the level, at the scope of the whole application, so I can inspect its value in the while condition. So with this small change that we've done, this should still work pretty well. It worked even with your uh, previous solution, with the double prompt, but I think that with, uh, in this case, we are really leveraging the power of the do-while loop because we are prompting only once. We are reducing duplication. So three, four, five, and then ask, and it doesn't work. <laughs> the grade is three. What? No, it shouldn't be three. Let me check again. Three, four, five, and then ask. Okay, the average grade is three, which is strange. It shouldn't be three. Uh, what, ha what is happening? What is happening? I don't think it's this one th here, uh, because two fixed is just uh, the number of decimals. So this is not the problem. Three, four, five, ask, and it says three. I think I tried it like this because the counter doesn't work somehow, says Angelo. Okay, okay. Um, so what could the problem be? Grade two will be a first thing. You know what? This is a good occasion to do some debugging. So let's try some debugging. And uh, how can we debug this thing? We are using prompts and alerts. So we, this needs um, a, a browser debugger. I don't know if we can just use this Chrome like this. Probably not. Mm, no. Pretty sure it's, it doesn't work like this. So I'm going to create a debug session here. A new folder, debug. I'm going to create a new file, an index.html. I'm going really fast on this because I don't want to waste your time on this. Um, create index.html, create the whole thing. I'm going to add a script. This script has a source. And I will say debugme.js for some reason. And here I'm going to create a debugme. Nope desbug debugme.js file and then I'm going to copy Angelo's solution in here. So now that we've got a browser in which uh, we've got a web page that we can inspect with the yeah with the live server or we can just open it like this maybe. We don't care to open the live server. So it's asking for the grades etc etc which works. And I'm going to the sources panel and have a look at your code. So your code is here. And now I'm going to place a breakpoint wherever I want to. And I'm going to refresh the browser so it's going to rerun the application. So grade 2 is currently undefined, of course. And if I step over the next function call, it's going to execute the prompt. So I'm asking for the number 3. Then the sum of grades, which was zero, will be incremented with grade two. And the counter two will be uh, incremented by one. Oops, I pressed F5 
and I shouldn't have. I completely uh, messed. So I have to do F10 in order to uh, go forward. Okay, sum of grades, F10, F10. And now I'm going to check if the grade is greater than zero and the grade is uh, less than seven. Since the grade is three, it is. So we can continue, F10. And it's going to ask again for another grade. So we'll do four. Four will be incremented to the sum of grades, which was three, and the counter, which was one, will be incremented with two. Now we've got grade four, grade four. So everything seems in place with the sum is three plus four, which is seven, and the counter says two. So we continue and we say five. And now grade two is five, which will be incremented to seven, giving 12. So now we've got the sum of grade, which is 12, the counter, which is three. Grade two and grade two is still five. Now I'm going to just press ESC. And this is the problem. It's still going on by adding grade two and increasing the counter. So this is the problem. And this is where we probably could have used um, the if. So what is the problem now? The problem is that you are automatically converting whatever is, um, comes from, from the prompt into a number. When I press ask, the prompt gives me null and converted into a number, it gives me zero. Zero is a valid number, which is inc incrementing sum of grades. So 12 plus zero is zero, which is fine. But the problem is that the counter is also incrementing. So uh, since the sum of grades is 12 and we have three numbers, we should have divided 12 by three, which gives me four, which is the correct average. But since we are um, mistakenly increasing also the counter, the counter st starts from three and becomes four, then we are dividing 12 by 4 because we are taking into account this non-valid grade and that's why we get 3. So as you can see, debugging was not really that difficult in that case. So what can we do to fix this? Well, we have to check if this grade is a valid one and only if it's a valid one, we can do the sum of all the grades, blah, blah, blah. So in this case in particular, maybe it is good to do something like if there is a grade 2 then perform these operations otherwise don't do them so let's try this code now and let's see what happens you see that the code now refreshed so we start with grade 2 which is 3 is grade 2 valid yes it is so i'm going to sum the grades and i'm going to increase the counter checking if the grade is still valid yes it is i'm going to put 4 and I'm going to move a little forward because until I reach uh, a non-valid number, it's not really that interesting. Okay, now we've got the sum of grades, which is 12, the counter to which is 3. And we want to stop here because we want 12 to be divided by 3. So in the next prompt, if I press ask, grade 2 is 0 and I don't want to uh, do anything if the grade is zero. So in that case, I'm going to completely skip this if. Grade two is zero, so the condition is false. And now we've got the average, gray, uh, the, the average uh, being calculated correctly. So the alert is giving me four. So as you can see, I don't know what's happening here. Okay, I'm uh, just uh, running the script till the end. So as you can see, the do while looked like a good fit because it looked like it's um, decreased uh, duplication of code since in the while loop we have to say prompt two times but in the do while we can use the prompt only once but in this case we also need to add an extra if that checks the validity of the input otherwise it's going to perform these two operations even if we don't want to so the if is mandatory in the do while loop apparently while it was not mandatory in the while loop because this was still performed after we check for some condition pretty strange but still it's um something worth looking at 
Okay, what else? This is the other uh, uh, experiment from Angelo, which is using the for loop. And the for loop is gracefully uh, solved by just adding uh, a begin condition like this. This is the, sorry, the begin statement, sorry. Uh, the begin statement here. I'm pretty tired at the end of the week. I'm starting to forget things and, uh, and also English. Um, then we've got the condition statement here and then we've got the counter here we actually got two counters we've got the sum of grades which is a counter that gets incremented with the grade the current grade and we've got the other counter which is just counting all the um, uh, all the grades that we witnessed so far so we could have used uh, both of them actually probably but um, still this is completely fine um, this works we could also use this as the the step statement because the step statement is give me another number so we could have used this for loop in multiple times depending on what we think the step increment is is it the increment of the counter is it the increment of the sum or is it just asking for a new grade it's exactly the same still as you can see, this loop is really, really difficult to read. So it's good as an exercise, but let's say that in production, in the real world, please don't use the for loop to solve this kind of problem. As you can see, the while loop or the do while loop are much more readable. The student can have a grade equal to zero in that case. How can we work that around? You want a grade of zero? Okay. We can try to fix this. Um, let's start from uh, Angelo's solution one. And I want the grade to not be um, greater than zero. I want it to be zero. And I could probably also have a grade which is greater than anything. So I just care that the grade is a valid grade. So it's a number. I just need to know if the grade is a number or not, because I can grade any number. I could probably even uh, uh, add negative grades. For example, uh, I received a minus two, if, if it's uh, your cup of tea. So, let grade is equal to prompt. You know what? Uh, we're going to not convert it immediately. Okay, so this is the grade string. And then I can say let grade is equal to let's convert the grade string into a number. Why do I do this? Well, I, can, I do this because now I have two variables. One is the grade, the number that I really care about, so I can use it. And the other one, the grade string, is something that I can reason about. Like uh, I can say... Um, is not we, we already saw this is not a number grade string or sorry i'm also writing it wrong um i can also do something like if grade string is different from null and grade string is different from the empty string because we already know that if uh, i cancel the prompt if uh, i press ask Great string will be a null value. And if I instead press OK without typing anything or even cancel, it's going to give me an empty string. So in this case, I'm, get, I'm receiving any possible uh, value that is, um, that is a valid number, that it can be converted into a number. In fact, we can even put this here inside. So if the great string is is going to be converted into a valid number then i'm going to convert it into a number i'm going to sum the grades uh, i'm going to increment the sum of grades with this grade i'm going to increment the counter and here i have to remember that i want to get the new value of grade string not of grade probably this works not really sure because uh i'm really tired today but let's find out Enter your grade, three, 
Okay, great str is not defined, so I'm using a different. Uh, what is that? Great str. Sorry. Let's go back. Okay, enter your grade three. Enter your grade four. Enter grade five. Then I press ask, and this is still working. Then what if I add a zero to the sum? Three, zero, five, and then ask. Three, zero, and five gave me 2.67. Is it correct? Probably, because three plus zero plus five is eight, and I have to divide eight by three grades. What is eight divided by three? Yeah, it's 2.666, so yeah, it's uh, correct. So here, I'm just caring about the fact that the number is a valid number. Or, if I want to accept only numbers from zero, to infinity, but not negative numbers, um, I can do it pretty easily. I can say, and also, we can say, after converting the great string to a number, I can check if it's greater than or equal zero. Or I can even do something like this without converting, because JavaScript is weakly typed, so if I do a comparison with less than, greater than, great string will automatically be converted into uh, a number. So in this case, the program will probably stop even if I put minus one. Yes, it, it does. So every number that is zero or positive. Okay. I hope that this was the answer to your question. What else? Uh, this was three attempts by Angelo. Beautifully done. And then we've got Bobby. Bobby decided to use a four in an, uh, let's say, improper way because there's no condition here. So this is an infinite loop that it's not really infinite because we've got a break somewhere. So this is a loop that starts infinite, but will eventually break. So there's a final score here. And then we loop from an i, which is z, starts with zero and increases. It's going to get the grade. And, uh, and here we've got a nice message that tells what, which grade we are looking at, which index of the grade we are looking at. And since i starts from zero, I'm pu he's putting i plus one, because this way it says, please add, add grade one, re add grade two, add grade three, which is fine. It's a, a nice touch. And then the final score gets increased with the current grade. And instead of uh, dividing the final score after the full loop, the final score gets divided inside of the full loop. So as you can see, this is an infinite loop, which will run forever until this condition applies. This condition is if there's no grade, if the grade is null or empty string or even zero, then I'm going to alert final score divided by i. Why is it i? Well, because i is actually the counter of the grades that we are collecting from the user. So at the end of the loop, at the last iteration, I will hold exactly the value of, our, uh, of the number of grades that we inspected. So it's going to alert and it's going to break the loop. This code is pretty fine. I have to say that there are a couple of things that bug me, um, but it works. Three, four, Five, and as you can see, it's asking for grade one, grade, uh, grade two, grade three. Grade four is nothing. I'm pressing ESC, and it's giving me exactly four. This is really nice code. Um, watch out, because I was never declared. And it still works. And this is one of those strange behaviors that JavaScript has, which is strictly related to the, to the infamous var keyword. If you don't put... If you put var, or if uh, you don't put any keywords, then this variable is being declared uh, nonetheless, but it's being declared globally, which means that wherever you declare this variable, it will be available at the root context of our application, always accessible from anywhere. 
which is something that you really don't want to have. Uh, you will understand this thing a little later when we talk about objects and functions. But there is a concept of scopes and grades is declared inside of the for loop. So grades will only be visible inside of the for loop. If I try to uh, console log grades, it's probably going to say that grades is undefined because grades was born and was used and died inside of the for loop and it's not available here outside of the of the for loop so there's a scope concept that we have to keep in mind and if you don't place let then i will be in the global scope so it will be available everywhere even if you don't want it to be available everywhere. You like to have scoped variables because they, li they live in only in their own scope and their validity is there, is only in their scope. It's uh, pretty well encapsulated. Where, while with uh, global variables, you could incur in problems. You could probably uh, overwrite another variable that should not be overwritten or something like that. So watch out for uh, declara decla the declaration of variables. So, okay, this is uh, awesome. Another thing that bugs me a little bit is the, the name of variables, which is not that important. The, the code still works. But this is not grades. This is the current grade that I'm getting from the user. So I would probably call it either grade or current grade or whatever you want. And also final score is not really the final score the final this variable is accumulating all the grades so this is most probably the the sum of all the grades as angelo said sum of grades we can just call it sum if we want to but it's not the final score because this the final score is actually sum divided by i and what is i i could be the index or it could be the counter or this can be the number of grades how many grades we had so far zero then i want to increase the number of grades and then here i'm going to say grades plus one because the grades started with zero and then here i can say sum divided by the grades sum divided by the amount the total of grades how many grades we had so far so i just changed variables but this probably looks a little more readable I'm going to also add some spacings here. As you understand, I'm really involved with the spacing things. And, and also, I would like to be consistent with, uh, with semicolons. So if you want to use semicolons, use them anywhere it's needed, at the end of every single statement. But you don't need to put a semicolon at the end of an if or a for, because that's not where it's intended to be. It's only at the end of statements. These are statements. Okay, um, we've got a little indentation problem also. Okay, so I think that this is uh, an awesome code. It works exactly like before. Three, four, five, nothing. And it says four. So this works perfectly. Uh, another interesting thing about this solution is that this solution is saying is telling a story and the story is um, get grades from the user until the grade is falsy and this is how most humans reason we say look forever until some breaking condition applies and that's why Bobby solved this uh, problem by using an infinite loop and a break that breaks the loop if a certain condition applies. But as I already told you, breaks and continues are quite dangerous. They are not really that readable. So if you want, you can just turn this code around and say, get grades from the user while the grade is truthy, which is Angelo's solution. As you can see, there's a strict correlation between while and until. While needs a continuation condition. 
So while the grid is truthy, I'm still going to gather grades. And then it is implicit that at, as soon as the grade is not truthy, then I will stop. In this other case, we've got the until, the, uh, un until word that expects a breaking condition, which is exactly the opposite of the continuing condition. So I know that probably this makes more sense in English to you, but usually we prefer to take this sentence and turn it over into a while with a continuing condition. So this is fine, but if we want to, we can just turn it around. Let's see if I can. So apparently the breaking condition is not great, so we want the grade to be positive, a truthy value. So we're going to continue until the grade is actually true. But the problem is that now uh, the grade is not there because it's being prompted for the first time here. So I also have to copy the initial getting of the grade here. And probably here we don't have grades because grades is created here. So there's another problem. We can do something like grades is equal to zero. So we declare and uh, assign an initial value to grades here. So this works. And we don't need to put a begin condition now because we already have it here. And then we can have a look at, uh, and then we can sum the grade because after getting the grade the first time, then we can sum uh, the, the grades together. And then I'm going to ask for a grade again. But this time I'm not going to let, I'm not going to redeclare the grade because I want to use the same global variable that I have here. And then this breaking condition is not really that important. At a certain point, the loop will end. And after the loop ends, I can just alert the sum divided by the grades. So I don't need all this if with a break. Something like this. Oh, we'd also need an extra space here. Okay, is this solution any better? No, probably not, because it has the, uh, the, the, the duplicated prompt, which is something that I really don't like. It's probably less understandable, but maybe that's also because of the for loop, which makes it a little more difficult to, to understand. So this is still a pretty valid solution that reduces duplication of the prompt makes it more clear that you want to loop forever until something happens. The real problem that I see in programming languages in general, it would be so nice to have an until uh, keyword, but we don't. So this is really, really similar actually to the do while loop because you are performing something and then you're checking for a condition to stop. So this probably is not well um, translated into a for loop with, uh, without the break, but it could be well translated into the do while, which makes almost exactly the same thing. In fact, probably also this doesn't work too much. Let's see, let's see one thing. Three, four, five, and also zero. No, it's, it's still working. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> because, um, yeah, the grade is going to be summed here, but it's not going to sum. Okay, there's a, uh, there's a very implicit thing going on here. If the grade is zero, you're going to add it to the sum. But since the grade is zero, you're going to stop there and divide the sum by the grades without incrementing the number of grades that we inspected so far. So grades is still three if we inspect the number three, four, five, and it's not incremented with the number zero. This was the problem that Angelo's code had, because if you put grade, uh, if you if you have a zero here, uh, we were adding zero to the sum of grades, but also adding the counter. If we want to make it more similar to Bobby's code, it's probably something like this. And that's it. So the grade can be summed, but you should never increase the counter if the grade is zero. You should increase the counter only if the grade is greater than zero. So this is pretty much the same as the code that Bobby is doing here. 
exactly the, well the same behavior so as you can see there are so many ways to approach the same problem some of advantages some of disadvantages and you choose what's best for you of course and not only for you but for the rest of the team too in fact if the rest of the team tells you no we are not allowed to use break you have to change your code so it doesn't use breaks but if the team is okay with breaks then this is a good solution Angelo, by the way, now it makes sense to me that you are tired because there was no announcement for the lesson this morning at 8 o'clock in Discord, I think. Exactly, yeah. I, I added um, an announcement yesterday because I found a proper, a proper meme to show. But yeah, this morning I was really, really tired and I couldn't come up with, uh, with something to say this morning. The, the, the announcements one hour, two hours before. And you can also see by my eye bags. I'm really, really tired. This, these weeks are getting really tiring with the, the other jobs that I'm doing outside of the academy. But I hope that I'm still uh, teaching you something valid. Okay, Bobby's second approach is turning the break, the infinite loop with a break, into a finite loop, which doesn't use a break. And this is pretty convoluted but it works so we've got a sum of grades we've got the end result and the end result apparently is the end result because it's the sum of grades divided by i if we want to we can say that i is the number of grades but it's fine uh, since we are still using grades as a variable here <clears throat> so here it says let's start from i is equal to zero and let's remember that we need to use let otherwise we are creating a global variable. We are checking if i is not not a number. So i should be a valid number. i++. Why should I check if i is a valid number? Because we've got a small hack here. As soon as we want the loop to finish, we create a condition that becomes false. So i was a number because it started from zero, it increments every time. But at a certain point, Bobby decides, no, let's put i as not a number. So in this case, a loop that was infinite becomes, uh, stops because of an i that is not a number. So this is a clever way to avoid break, but it's still somehow a break because there's an if that creates a breaking condition. So this is another really, really clever approach and I thank Bobby for this interesting uh, solution because it shows us how different people can solve the same problem in so many different ways, even very creative ones. I wouldn't say that this is a good solution uh, for the rest of the team because it's uh, really strange how this uh, I becomes not a number. Why is it not a number? Just because of, we want to make this, uh, this um, condition false. And we could have made this condition false in other ways. For example, we could have created a Boolean value. Uh, I don't know, let's say game over. Game over starts with false. And here we are continuing until we don't have game over. And then at a certain point, the breaking condition says, hey, you know what? Game over now is true. So there's no not a number involved. There's no strange numbers, magic numbers involved. We use a Boolean value to store the fact that the game is not over yet. So I'm continuing until the game is over. And if a certain event occurs, then I'm going to say, okay, this is now game over. And in that case, you can also... Uh, place this end result outside of the loop. If you put this end result outside of the loop, let's say, well, let's say directly here, let at end result is equal to blah, blah, blah. We don't even need to declare it here. Well, in that case, uh, you are performing an operation outside of the loop, which makes sense because this operation must be performed only once, once you got all the inputs that you needed. Instead, if you put end result is equal to sum of grades divided by i inside of the full loop, it could seem that this calculation is being performed multiple times, 
which is not true. It is performed only once at the end. So once we change this code like this, it is a little more evident what is happening here. So we start with the sum of grades zero and we are using a Boolean variable game over, which starts with false. Then I'm going to continue until it's not game over. I'm going to get the current grade. I'm going to sum the grade to the sum of grades. And if the grade at a certain point is not what I want, it means that I want to stop the game. So I'm going to flip the value of game over to true. So I'm got getting outside of the loop because I have all the information needed to perform my calculation. And only at the end, I'm going to perform the calculation and alert it with a final semicolon here. Is it going to work? Hopefully. Three, four, five, zero. Still working. Okay. I think that this Boolean value, which I called game over, but you can call it as you wish, of course, um, can really help sometimes in uh, understanding what's going on here without using this is none or other strange stuff. What else do we have? Another solution by Bobby, sum of grades is zero and result is zero. Grades, and grades is just a thing that should be different from the empty string. So first of all, it's different from the empty string because now grades is undefined. Uh, we still have the missing let here, but we've got some more spacing in here at least. Um, then we get the nth grade, we sum it, and here we are doing the and we are recalculating the end results at every single iteration. So this is cool because if you console log this, it's going to give you the partial results. It's going to give you the current average until you have all the grades. So if I put that console log there, this is what happens. Grade one, three, and the, okay, the average is infinity, which is not what I expected. Uh, grade two is four, and the average is seven, which is not true. Uh, grade three is five, and the average is six, which is not true. And then I press ESC, and it says four. So the end result works, but those partial results look like they are not really, really that good. So the first partial result was infinity. Why is it infinity? So we've got i, which was initialized as zero, grades was three. So the sum of grades, which started with zero, becomes three. And the end result should be three divided by zero, because i is zero. And that's why it started with infinity. And then we've got other uh, other calculations that we don't really, really care. But I don't know if you got this. You know, we can debug it if you, if you, if you care. But uh, yeah, we've got a small problem. It looks like it's uh, calculating the partial results, but the partial result is being calculated wrong. And the only real partial result that we care about is the end result. So the problem with this approach is that we are doing useless calculations. It, this is a very simple calculation, of course, but if it was a complex calculation, then we would probably want to care about the last calculation, which in that case makes a lot of sense to do something like if it's the end of the loop, then please perform this calculation. Or instead of using an if inside of here, as we already saw, we can just put the end results outside like this, let end results, which is interesting only here but this probably creates another problem let's see three four five ask no it's not it's not giving a problem okay okay uh, the problem that i expected was that i was a variable that uh, is available only in the for scope so it was not available here outside of for loop but apparently it is available if i do console log i it's going to print the real value of i outside of the loop let's try again but this time i'm going to refresh completely 
blah, blah, blah. Okay, I'm, I'm going to put it here. Okay, let's try again. So, three, four, five, ask. Oh, this is what I expected. Reference error. I is not defined. I was declared inside of the for loop and only lives inside of the for loop. So I cannot console log I. Why was it working before? Well, the reason why it was working before is that since we already executed some codes that didn't have the let in the code, it means that there was some dangling global I that was used in our last execution. So you see, that's a problem with not using let. If you're not using let, you have a global variable hanging there somewhere, which is going to be used even if it was not intended to be used. So how do you solve this? Well, pretty easy. You declare the, the variable outside and then you assign a value here. Or you can also assign a value here and let this begin statement empty, which is exactly the same thing. But you need i outside of the scope of the for loop so you can print it and you can use it for the, uh, for the calculation. If you don't do it, then, well, Bobby's solution is still valid. You can perform the calculation inside of the for loop because inside of the for loop i'm going back 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 inside of the for loop i lives but this is, i think is not a good reason to place this calculation inside of the for loop not just because i is available here and not outside if it's not available outside you just make it available so the final refactor of this would be i would say grade should be the name of this variable because I want one grade, the current grade. And then I could be the number of grades. If you want, you can say grades number, or something like that. I don't know, I'm, I'm not really good with the uh, variable names, but let's make one thing a little slightly different. And at this point, I want the end result to be computed only at the end, and I can declare it right away. I don't need to declare it at the beginning of the code because I just need it here and um, now we still have the problem grades number is not visible here but we can put it here let grades number is equal to zero and then I'm not going to add this begin condition so we start with the sum of grades which is zero we haven't inspected any grades so far so this value is zero this grade is undefined and we want to check if the grade is different from empty string. Well, different from empty string is also pretty strange. Uh, we could probably use, as we already saw, it works. We can just say it's a truthy value. The problem is that if it's a truthy value, well, this is not a truthy value. So we, can, we have to start with some value which is truthy at first. Grade is equal to one. Or, as you can see, Bobby decided that the grade should be different from empty string, which is valid when the grade is undefined. But it looks strange because grade will never be an empty string since grade is automatically converted into a number. So it will never be a string. It will always be either undefined or a number. So this is also quite strange. It's not really that readable. Uh, I don't know if there's a good way to solve this. I already told you that one good way could be using a, a strange number like one or minus one or whatever you want. Or you can repeat the prompt so you already have at least one real value here. But then you also have to flip these two statements because you want to first sum the grade into the sum of grades and then you want to get the new current grade. So I'm flipping around this code, but every one of your solutions were, was valid. I've got a message from OBS Studio saying problems reconnecting. Are you still there with me? Or do we have any technical issues? Is anybody home? Let me also have a look at... Um, let me also have a look at Slack if you... Oh, okay. 
Okay, we've got the stream down. S Angelo said it here. I received. I received a message from OBS stating that it went down. Is it? Is it? Oh, come on. Is it on now? Are you there now? Please tell me you're there. The stream don't work here. Okay. No. Not yet. Yes, back up again, I think, uh, says Angelo. Tiago, can you confirm that it works now? Let's see if things will... Yeah, it's back up. Okay. I love technical issues. I really love them. Yes. Okay, okay, okay. That's fine. So, okay, we, we mix this code again and again and again. Other attempts? Yeah, Bobby4, which is the last, the last one. So, Bobby4 says, sum of grades is zero. Let grades, which is the current grade, is nothing. Still going to um, check if grades is different from empty string. And as you can see, Bobby decided to do the calculation at the end. But apparently Bobby also needed to do i minus 1 because apparently the number of uh, grades were too many. And this is also another clever solution. So this is a cool solution that Angelo could have applied to. Here we had this problem which was I don't want to increase the counter if the grade is 0. Or I can do something else probably. I can say that counter will take into account that the last number was 0 and I'm going to use a minus 1 so I can, don't need an if. This was very fast. So what, what, what are we doing here? This do while code had one problem. If we start adding grades, then at a certain point we will have a grade which is 0. In that case, the 0 can be summed to the sum of grades, but it's, uh, we didn't like that the counter was increased with the number 0, because with the number 0 we wanted to stop there. And if we want to stop there, well, we can increase the number, who cares about that, and then we decrease it once again. This is Bobby's solution on this last attempt. So the grade, the current grade, can also be zero, but if it's zero, then I'm increasing the sum of grades, I'm incrementing the variable i, but then I'm taking into account that there was a last i that was incremented, so I'm going to use i minus one in order to have the correct number of grades. Pretty, pretty cool. It is strange because you increase and then you decrease, but it's working. It's working pretty well. So that's another clever solution. Awesome. So many good solutions. Thanks for, uh, for your efforts, guys. This is, really, this is really good. I love your commitment. And I think this is a huge teaching experience. Okay, let's move on to something else. For example, I gave you last Wednesday some warm-ups. Shall we do the warm-ups together? Um, did anyone... W does anyone want to try these warm-ups by themselves and you don't want to see these warm-ups together? Or, uh, well, the warm-ups are pretty easily. They are actually very, very similar to the exercises that you already saw with me and in the tasks. I was wondering whether we always have to use some kind of counter, says Angelo. Would you have done it similarly with the counter? Um, these exercises uh, involve a lot of numbers to add and to, and to count. So in that case, I would probably always use a counter. But then, as soon as we start using data structures such as arrays and objects, you will see that there's not a need for a counter because arrays give you a structure that is uh, much more than just a counter. You can store multiple values inside of an array 
and then perform operations in that array. An array is just a collection of elements. So you have a variable that doesn't store a single value, but it stores multiple values, a collection of values. So, so far we need counters, but then at a certain point we will not need counters anymore. Uh, another cool thing that I showed you, and it's really, really important, and we're going to talk about it again today, is another kind of counter, which is not a real counter. It's a Boolean value that starts false, then at a certain point becomes true, or vice versa. It starts true, and then at a certain point becomes false. This is another important counter that we really, really need to understand. So... Let's go with the first warm-up. Print all numbers from 0 to 10 excluded. Try with a while loop, then with a full loop. Uh, Bobby did all his loops. So we can have a look at his solutions, or we can have a look at mine first and then his. It's pretty much the same. Um, I'm going to go with my solutions first. So let's print all numbers to 0 to 10 excluded, and we start with a while loop. So with a while loop, we need to remember the recipe. The recipe is all about creating a variable that is our index, and I can call it i or index. Let's call it i because it's the usual. So we begin the loop by declaring a variable and assigning an initial value, which is zero, which is the first number that we want to print. Then in the while loop, we need to get a condition. And the condition will be that i the continuation condition is that i is less than 10, because if i is 10, I want to stop there. So I'm saying i is less than 10. And inside of the loop, I want to print the current number, and I'm going to do it with console log because it's not annoying with my, the pop-up. And then, of course, I have to also add the step statement, otherwise this will be an infinite loop. And the step statement is i++, plus plus. I'm incrementing i. So starting with 0, printing the current value of i, and then incrementing it. And at a certain point, i will become 10, so I will stop the loop and it will be over. This is pretty standard, it should work. Okay, 0, blah, blah, and then it returns 9. Well, this is more of a side effect. These are printed, this is returned, but this it's fine, we can just uh, ignore the returned value, we just want to see the printed values. So yeah, this is a good loop. If we want to reason um, like Bobby reasons, like with the until, we can do something like while true, so we're creating an infinite loop, we console log i, we increment i, and then if i becomes 10, then we break the loop. You see, I completely switched from um, a loop with a while condition into an infinite loop with a breaking condition. Let's see if it works. Yep, zero. And it also has this uh, a cool f side effect of returning undefined instead of nine, which makes it, it's no use. So, is this better? Yes, if you, if you think more of a, like an until, but I don't think it's better in the sense that it's more code and it's also a little more difficult to read. Remember that if you have a breaking condition, like one uh, i is equal to 10, you can just flip it into a i different from 10 and this becomes a loop, a, a decent loop, a standard loop. It still works. i different from 10 can also be called i less than 10, which is pretty much the same. You're never going past 10. You're never going to have uh, some number, some i that is greater than 10. So it's good to have i less than 10. Okay, uh, I should do this with a while loop, then with a for loop. And this is just a warm up to remember how the for loop works. For needs a begin condition, which is exactly this one then it needs the uh not uh, sorry not begin condition i'm so tired begin statement then it it wants the condition statement and then it wants the increment all in one convenient place 
And then in the for loop, I just care about the body. So the for loops make it, makes it more evident that this is the only part of the body that I care about. And it's pretty difficult to forget the increment. Well, in the while loop, it is pretty easy to forget the increment. So this for loops behaves exactly like the while loop. Well, not exactly because it's not returning the number, the last number, but who cares? This is still a good solution. And as you can see, when you have a while with a continuing condition, it is really easy to turn it into a for loop. If you have instead a while with a breaking condition, let's let's uh, recreate the, the other while. Let i is equal to zero while true infinite loop. I'm going to console log i and then I'm going to i plus plus and then I'm going to break if i is equal to 10 then break how am I going to turn this while into a for loop uh, it's difficult I don't know so the yeah the begin statement is this one the condition is nothing true uh, there is an increment here I hope hopefully this works and then in the body I have to console log but also break the loop probably it works like this let's see if it works exactly the same as the while loop no nope, because it printed 10 so there's something wrong in here and why is it not working exactly the same well, we have to inspect and debug what happens at each iteration. So let's try to imagine it. i is equal to zero. I'm going to console log. Uh, well, it is always true. I'm console log zero. And if i is 10, I'm going to break, but it's not. So i gets incremented. Now i is equal to one. The condition will always be true. So I'm console logging and i is not 10, so I'm not breaking. So I'm incrementing i i from 1 becomes 2. The condition is always true, etc, etc, etc. At a certain point, i will become 9, so I'm not going to break, but I'm incrementing, and i is now equal to 10. The condition is still true, so I am printing 10, and only in that moment I am actually stopping. So I need to check this condition before the console log. So probably I just need to move this if before the console log to make it work exactly like the while. Yep, now it's uh, actually printing the numbers from 0 to 9. But as you can see, the difference was really subtle. I just have to switch the orders of the operations. Is it's, it's so complicated and so difficult uh, to, to spot the bug. It's so easy to generate the bug by just inverting the order of these statements. It's so difficult to spot the bug that it's much, much more convenient to write while loops and for loops as continuation conditions instead of stopping breaking conditions. Bobby says, or you can just set the if condition to i is equal to 9. Yes, yes, but this makes it even more complicated. If I say i is equal to 9, 9 is really a magic number. Uh, and by magic number, I mean a number that apparently makes it work, but we don't know what is the meaning of 9. Why should I use 9 instead of 10? Uh, yeah, we can say that it says 10 excluded, so probably we shouldn't use 9. But you see, triggering these numbers and then forgetting what their purpose is, well, it makes it really, really difficult to, to understand this code. Why is this 10 at the end of the loop? And why is this 9 at the end of the loop or 10 at the beginning of the loop? I don't know. Well, I know now, but in one week, since I'm tired, I will probably forget why I put this if here. And in two weeks, I will say, I don't like this if here. I'm going to put it here and I will break everything. So watch out because the break and continue make your code difficult to read and to debug and to understand. Let's go to the second one. Print all numbers from 10 to 0 excluded, but reverse this time. Try with a for loop, then with a while loop. Okay, let's try with a for loop. And we start with a let. And here we've got multiple solutions again. I want to print all numbers from 0 to 10 excluded. 
If I want to make it simple, then I can say that my i, my counter, starts from zero and it will stop only if uh, it reaches zero. So it will continue if it's greater than zero and it will stop if it's equal to zero. So as you can see, every time I think about the breaking condition in my mind, I just flip the condition and turn it into a continuation condition. I stop when i is equal to zero, then I will continue when i is different, greater than zero. And then here, I want to decrease the number, not increase it, because I start from 10 and I want it to become 9, 8, 7, 6, etc, etc. And then I'm just console logging. And this should just work. It's going to print all the numbers from 10 to 0 excluded. Yes, it does. Uh, I can try with a while loop and the while loop is just an exercise because you want to create the begin statement in its own line like this then you want to create a while with the condition inside of it and then here you have to remember to put the body and also the step which in our recipe is always at the end it's usually always good to have the step at the end because if you put it before the console log, then probably I will have its value changed by now. And we don't want it to change. We want the console log to, uh, to, to, do, to print the current value and then we step and then we increment or decrement. So this is, yeah same things as always the uh, re i want to remind you that the last one is not printed it's returned and as soon as we start looking at functions you will see what return means but for now we don't care if there's an extra one in the console log okay uh, there is another way to solve this which i'm not recommending you but if we want we can use the for loop with uh, the i that starts exactly like we already saw. So it's a loop that starts from zero and goes into 10. And in the console log, we perform a calculation. So we can do something like 10 minus i probably. Because 10 minus i, when i is zero, will give me 10. When i is one, will give me nine. When i is uh, two, will give me eight. And when i is nine, will give me 10 minus nine. 1 and if i is equal to 10 it's not just going to print it so this is uh, quite strange i'm not recommended it but it works it prints all the numbers from 10 to 1 by using an iterator that counts forward but then i'm logging backwards i'm showing you this solution because uh, it's part of the solutions that we can see in the triangles. We can count things and perform operations that uh, go in um, proportionally inverse. And the same we can do here, of course. Um, I'll leave this as an exercise to you if you want. You can turn this while loop with an i that decreases into a while loop with, a while, with an i that increases, but we console log in descending order. Print even numbers from 0 to 10 excluded with a for loop. Well, you know them already. I don't think we need uh, to, to rehearse them. But the hint we can say is that we can loop from uh, 0 to 10 and then, well, increase by 2. Which is probably the most performance solution, let's say. So i starts with 0, i is less than 10 and i will be increased by two well uh, i'm actually exactly writing the the code so it's uh, let i is equal to zero i is less than 10 i gets incremented by two and then i console log i which will print exactly zero zero two four six eight and then it stops this is pretty easy there was another way to to solve this problem which was about uh, starting from zero again, but then counting half of the times, incrementing by one, and then console logging the 
result of uh, a multiplication because zero starts from uh, i starts from zero and i times two is zero but then i increases it becomes one and then two then three then four and every time it gets uh, multiplied by two so it will give me zero two four six eight um, if you can wrap your head around these things you can try to use that pseudocode that I sometimes write. So i is equal to zero and it's going to print zero. Then here it's going to be i is equal to two because it's incrementing by two. So it's going to increment two. Then it becomes four and it's going to increment four. Then it becomes six and it's going to print six. Then it's going to print eight. Uh, it's going to be eight, so it's going to print eight then it's going to be 10 and this is ending the loop this is the four the first for loop the second one behaves slightly differently which is i is equal to zero and it's going to print zero times two so zero then i becomes one because in this case we are incrementing by one every time but we're stopping uh half halfway there so here it's going to print one times two which is 2 and then we are continuing over and over again with uh, 2 3 4 which will be 2 times 2 3 times 2 4 times 2 and we just perform the calculation which is 4 6 8 and at the end we've got i is equal to 5 which will end the loop because i should always be less than 5 in order to continue so this is how we can see what's happening in this for loop and then there's uh, one last uh, way to solve this uh, problem, which is kind of stupid, but it looks a, a little bit like the sieve of Eratosthenes that we saw last Wednesday. So I'm looping over all the numbers, but I'm printing all the numbers that I care about. Not every single number, but only the ones that I care about. So I have to put an if to check if the number is a number I care about. And it's a number I care about if it's an even number. How do I check if a number is even? I can say that i, the remainder of dividing i by 2, is 0. If it's 0, then i can be divided exactly by 2, which means it's even. And in that case, I'm going to console log the number itself. So in this case, this is much more complicated. I'm going to copy a little bit because it's going to be long. i is equal to 0, it's going to print 0. i is equal to 1, but the number is not uh, even, so it's going to be skipped. Then i is equal to 2, and it's even, so it's going to be logged. i is equal to 3, and it's not even, so it's going to be skipped, etc, etc. So as you can see, the loop loops a lot because it loops 10 times but at the end skipping all the numbers that aren't worth um, showing it's still going to show exactly 0, 2, 4, 6, 8 and then end there it's just a little less performant because it's going to have 10 iterations in the loop while the other two solutions were iterating just 5 times but we don't really really care about this kind of performance as we already said last time we care more about uh, complexity which is a more complex topic still working not the best solution but still working and it's a good approach to understand the sieve of Eratosthenes that will allow us to print all the prime numbers up to a certain numbers that we want Guess the number. Prompt the user for a number until it equals the secret number or it's a falsy value. And we've got some, um, some solutions from you guys. Uh, who, who did this? Was it Angelo? I don't remember. Sorry, guys. There was Bobby Loops. Oh, yeah, of course, Bobby, because Bobby did all the exercises here. And then there was Sal's Quest, which is a, a, a different exercise, very similar to this one, actually. But still, let's try together this one. So, guess the number. Prompt the user for a number until it equals the secret number or it's a falsy value. And this hint says, remember, until something is true means while the same is false and vice versa. So, if we want to use break, 
we can just translate this kind of requirement in code with a break, infinite loop and a break. Otherwise, we can try to flip the condition over and use the while loop. So let's num let's secret number because I want I have to have a secret number. Let's say that the secret number is seven. And then I'm going to ask the user what's the secret number. So let guest number is equal to let's do the usual prompt that converts the number. Uh, prompt give me a number between 1 and 10. And I'm saying 1 because of the usual trick. If the number is 0, I'm looping out. And now I can say while. When should I stop? I should stop if the guest number is equal to the number that I had in mind. This is where should I stop. So when should I continue? Well, I should continue when the guest number is not equal to the secret number. Okay, so if get, well guest number is different from the secret number, then I'm going to stop. But there's also another condition. If it's a falsy value, I'm also going to stop. So I have to also say if guest number is different from zero. And we can just say guest number because it's a truthy value. If it's a falsy value, I have to stop. But if it's a truthy value, then I'm going to continue. And I'm putting these two in an end because I want to continue if the guest number is actually a, a, a real number and if it's different. If the guest number is equal to the secret number or if it's a falsy value, I'm going to stop. I said or. So the breaking condition is an or, so the continuing condition is an end. Why is that? Because of the Morgan's laws. So the breaking condition, we can say it here, breaking condition, falsy value, or uh, number was guessed, Num uh, number was correct. Okay, this is the breaking condition. If it's a falsy value or if the number was correct, we can translate this into guessed number is zero, a falsy value, or the number was correct. So guest number is equal to the secret number. This is the breaking condition. This is what Bobby would use in an infinite loop to say, hey, break at this moment. As soon as the guest number is a, a falsy value, which we can also write as like this, not guest number, if you remember how falsy values work, you can say if it's not, if it's a falsy value or if the guess number is correct, I'm going to stop. Now, this is the breaking condition. So the continuing condition is the opposite. Of course, because if I don't want to break, I want to continue. So this thing should be the opposite. And what is the opposite of all this? I'm going to put a exclamation mark and a couple of parentheses before all of this and now I'm going to apply De Morgan's laws the not of two statements in or becomes the end of the two statements negated so this becomes this statement negated and not guest number when I negate it it's a double negation so it becomes just guest number Right? If I had not guess number and I negate it again, this is a not not, which flips the value and reflips again. So this is just guess number. And then the or becomes an end between the two. Thank you, Reale Mutua. I know this uh, <laughs> revolution. Uh, I know what you're talking about. This is one of my former students in Power Coders. Love to see you here. But who are you, Revolution SY? Please show yourself. Who is that? This is not Hamza. Hamza had another nickname. Let's see if you want to show. So guess number and I want to flip this thing over. So if something is equal, when I flip it, it's different. So this will be guess number is different from secret number. So this is my continuation condition, which is exactly what I wrote here. 
So we just use some uh, Boolean algebra to get to the same results. As you can see, these conditions can be either created through common sense, because it makes sense to you in English, or if it doesn't make too much sense, then we can always apply some uh, Boolean algebra, which is pretty easy, especially De Morgan's laws, to get where you want to get. Big hi from Antoine, Assem and Sohaib. So there's not even one person there, there's three persons there. Antoine, Assem and Sohaib are some three of the best students that I have in the Power Coders program. Lovely to see you here. I'm pretty sure that you're not here to learn anything because you already know all of this stuff, but uh, probably you're here for the entertainment and the encouragement. So thanks a lot for being here. Okay, so now we have a while loop and Probably, if this condition is true, it means that either the guess, uh, it means that the guess number was not correct. So I want to say, hey, the number is not correct, please give me another one. So I can say, guess number is now, again, another prompt. <laughs> uh, purple heart from Revolution SY. Love you guys. Um, Sorry, not the right number. Please try again. See how polite it is. So guest number will be another guess. And as soon as the guest number is either a falsy value or the same as the secret number, then I'm going to stop with the loop. And if I'm stopping the loop, it means that something happened. So in this case, I can just alert or maybe console log. Let's alert this time and we can say you got it and I don't even care to say what the number was but the problem is that actually I don't know if I got it really let's see uh, the number the secret number is seven so get a number between one and ten is it three no sorry not the right number please try again is it zero you got it no, I didn't get it. I just ended the loop because uh, I put a falsy value. So this alert is not really that good. I also have to put another if here inside that says if the guest number is actually the guest one, the, the secret one, then I can say you got it. Otherwise, I got out of the loop not because I guessed it, but because I gave up. So we can say it. You gave up. And then a crying face. Crying face, which is difficult to do because I have to... Okay, I have to use the uh, escaping character. Or I can use the, as always, the double quotation mark to make the apostrophe work better. That looks way complicated, says Bobby. Is it? Yeah, it is. And Bobby also used my new emote that I put on, uh, on, on Twitch. Um, yeah, this is not really nice because we still have this if here and this if here, which look a lot like the same, but still, I think it's a valid code. It makes everything very, very explicit. Wait a second, I'm going to copy all of it, refresh, and let's try. So, give me a number, is it three? three? No. Is it eight? No. Is it ask? You gave up. And if I try again, three? No. Five? No. Seven? You got it! And now the code works. Um, it is complicated. Is there any other solution that we can find which is better than this one? Let's see Bobby's loops. These are Bobby's loops, which as you can see are very similar to the code that we, that we saw so far. Maybe we could use some more indentation, you know, makes it more clear what we're doing here and here too. But other than that, awesome. And this is the secret number. So let me see what is this thing. Let secret number is five for him. Let user input is nothing. Then there's an infinite loop with a begin condition that is nothing. User input should always be different from the empty string. And then we've got an I++, which was never mentioned before. 
So when you do an I++, it means that it automatically creates um, a, a global variable called I, and probably it's going to be initialized and undefined, but if you increment undefined, it will be turned automatically into a number, the number is zero, so it starts with zero and it will be incremented. If this code works, it's almost a miracle because you are using a very subtle thing, which is a quirk in JavaScript. JavaScript is resilient and it's not going to complain if I is not defined, probably. Let's see. Yeah, still works, three, Oh, I is not defined. Apparently, your code worked because at a certain point in your life, you had an I equal to zero like this. This is a global variable that makes this I++ actually work. So as you can see, not putting let, not declaring a variable is really, really dangerous in JavaScript because uh, you could come up with some global variables that uh, yield unexpected behaviors and everything is fine when you guess the number it works but what happens if I say zero it just stops without saying anything so probably what you want to add to this code is also an else if the user input is falsy value then I'm also going to break but with another message such as uh, I'm sorry uh, with another message such as uh, Boo. Okay. So there's still an if else. And this code is starting to get really, really difficult to read because of the lack of indentation. So let's add some indentation here, some spacing, and especially some, uh, some cool tabs. So now we see what's the hierarchy of all these statements. So I++ is really, really dangerous. You want to have let I is equal to zero, maybe. But another thing that I can tell you is why do you need I? You're not using it anywhere. And if you want to increment, this is still going to be incremented. If you want an infinite loop, this is still an infinite loop because this loop will stop only when the user input is uh, not an empty string, which never occurs. In fact, I think that you can even probably remove this. This is an empty loop. Uh, this is a, sorry, an infinite loop with a four. And the infinite loop can be also done with a while, while true, for example, while one. So the reason why you use a for loop, uh, well, there's no real reason. You could use a for, you can use a while, because you're still using a, an infinite loop. And the only reason why this loop is ending is because of these breaks here. But it's fine. Uh, it's, it's still a solution. Let's see if it works. Sometimes I fear that I'm missing something. Guess a number, two, boo. Nope, it's not working because else, no, I have to put the condition, I'm sorry. Uh, you see, I had to, to inspect. If I do else, then the user input was not a secret number and it's going to just quit. I don't want to quit. I want to quit only if the user input is a falsy value. So I can say not user input. Now the user input is a falsy value and I'm, all, and I'm going to break. Otherwise the loop will continue indefinitely forever. I'm saying five and it says success. Again, I'm saying two and then ask and it says boo. So this is exactly the same as my code, but my code has um, a proper loop because the loop is actually checking for some condition. It's not an infinite one. And the body in the loop is pretty easy and then I have to do any fails outside of the loop once I see what is the outcome of the game. In this case, the outcome is checked inside of the loop, which is fine. Uh, it's the difference between a while and an until, as you already understood. You will tell me if this is better or not. I actually prefer to do my final calculations at the end of a loop, not inside of it. Because if I do them on inside of a loop, it looks like these alerts and yeah, these alerts get, get done multiple times in multiple iterations, which is not. You're just saying, if we are at the end of the loop, then you're going to alert. And in that case, maybe it's better to place this if else after the loop, not inside of it. But that's just my opinion. You will, you will probably um, 
com- compare your my opinion with the other people's opinions if and when you will get a job in the IT field. I hope so. I hope so. Because it's a wonderful world. Sum all the numbers from 1 to 5. Hint. Use a variable to accumulate partial results. You did well in this code too. Um, I remember that Angelo did something here. I'm sorry if I forgot completely your... Can I see it here? Stream is done for me, said uh, Angelo. Yeah, sorry. Angelo gave me the grades here. Yeah, but I, I, I already showed them. Okay, no, so I, I showed everything. Uh, sum all the numbers from 1 to 5. Let's sum them all pretty easily. If I want to sum the numbers from 1 to 5, I need a counter. I need a partial sum that starts from 0 and gets incremented. So this is actually simpler than the grading exercise because you don't need even need to divide the grades, uh, the, the sum by the amount of grades. That's why this is a warm-up exercise. So um, I'm going to create a sum which starts from 0 and then in a loop, I can use a for loop with uh, the usual i. Let's use the common recipe from i to 5 because it says to 5 here. And you know what? It says all the numbers from 1 to 5. So maybe we can also start with 1 as an i. Nobody said that we should start i with 0. As you can see, programmers usually start with 0, but there are some uh, other cases in which we want to start with 1 because this is uh, relevant to the problem that we want to solve. In fact, we can also call it number instead of i if we care to say that this is the current number. And I'm going to increment all the numbers. So in this case, I'm going to increment sum by the current number. And that's it. I want to console log the sum. And hopefully, if I'm not too tired today, this should work. All the numbers from 1 to 5 is 10. Why is that? Because 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 is 10, excluding 5. Okay, that was it. Build a string that looks like this. Na 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 Batman. You already know how to build that if you look at the slides. Because in the slides I already gave you this. What is that? This is the code that does exactly the same thing. But this, as you can see, uses concepts that you don't know, such as array, join. So we don't want to do it like this. We want to do it manually and in a, in a way that we can control. So this is very similar to the sum. Instead of incrementing a number, we are incrementing a string. So we can say let string is equal to, let's start with an empty string. And then I'm going to loop. 16 times it says so let's loop 16 times for uh, let i is equal to so from 0 to 16 i'm always using this recipe starting from 0 comparing with 16 if i want to start with 1 i have to compare with 16 included that's that will give you exactly 16 numbers but usually we start from 0 and we go till 16 and then we increment i++ and in that case the string can be incremented with a na space. Why is it like so? Because the plus is an overloaded operator that can be used to sum things or to concatenate things. And here we are concatenating strings together. And finally we have to append Batman and that's it. So we can do it like this, string plus equals Batman and then we console log everything or we can of course console log the results of this uh, last concatenation but I as I already know I don't like to assign things wh while I'm doing uh, while I'm printing them it's really really um, error prone so let's see what happens let me close this one let's see what happens when I do this, na 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 na, 16 times, and then Batman, this works like a charm. So as you can see, incrementing is not only for numbers, it's also for strings, you can concatenate things. And this is all that we need to know for the warm-ups. This was just the warm-up, let's do the real stuff. And Bobby did everything. So, about the shapes, I don't know if Bobby has anything uh, 
relevant show. He did exactly the same thing. Now he also stored a variable called Batman. He incremented the na variable with all the nas that he could find, starting from one and ending at 16 included. And then he console logged the sum of na and Batman, which is totally fine. Really, really similar to my, my experiment. Uh, this was the sum of five numbers and he stored the result in a partial result, which at the end becomes the total result, not a partial anymore, but still, this is also fine. And then we can go with the shapes. My former Power Coder students know what I'm talking about because we did a lot of exercises about shapes. I love shapes. So the first exercise is about building an ASCII rectangle, given the number of rows and columns. ASCII is just a fancy way to say rectangle made of characters. ASCII is a standard that we are currently used. We are actually using an, an, a, an extension of the standard, which, as you know, maps any character with a special numeric code. It's a table that we already saw when dealing with the alphabetical ordering of uh, strings. So we don't really care about what ASCII is, what it stands for. We just need to say that it should be a rectangle made of asterisks. So for example, this is a rectangle with three rows and I think five columns. One, two, three, four, five columns. How do I do this? Well, I need to do this with a double for loop because or with a double loop in general you can do it with a while too if you want to but uh, we it needs to be double because you have to iterate over the rows and over the columns also i can try to accumulate this rectangle in its own string and then print the whole string together or i can print pieces of this rectangle um, at the same time. So let's try to split this problem, as, as, as the hint says, into multiple subproblems. How to build one row and how to repeat the process for multiple rows. So we can look at it like this or we can look at it in other ways. For example, how to build one row. If we give for granted that the row has five asterisks, then we can say let row is equal to a string that contains five asterisks but the asterisks are hard-coded we don't want them to be five we want to be maybe user generated or just taken from outside but this is a row so if i want to create three rows then i have to loop over these rows i can do a let i is equal to zero i less than the number of rows that i want which can be three or whatever. You know what? I'm going to create a variable here, let rows is equal to three, and I'm going to use this value so I can change it here and not inside of my code. I think it's uh, cleaner this way. So for the number of rows, I'm going to build one entire row, and I want this row to be printed, for example. I can console log the row. Is this going to work? Let's see. I would really love to, um, to execute this code somewhere not in the browser, but still. It doesn't look exactly the same as I expected because it says this row three times. Uh, this is working, but the console of the Chrome developer tools are trying not to mess up too much with the too many characters. So it's going to just say, yeah, it's this string here, but repeat it three times. If I want to make it more clear, I should probably accumulate a string with all the rows and then print everything at once. So we can say let rectangle is equal to an empty string. And then instead of console logging the row, I can accumulate this rectangle by adding the row. And then finally, I can console log the whole rectangle. This still has problems, but for now, I'm going to stop here and, and show you how this looks a lot like summing strings with the na 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 uh, Batman. Bobby says, document write time. Yes, in a while, not immediately. Uh, this code still has problems. And what's the problem here? 
The problem here is that now we've got all the rows printed, but they are one next to the other. I forgot to go to a new line at every end of the row. How do I do a new line? Not with document write. I can do it in multiple ways. One way can be adding a backslash n, because backslash n is the special character that goes to a new line. So instead of using strange stuff, we can use th things that we already discovered in our lessons, in our academy. And if I do this, now I see the rectangle more correctly. I can also add it here if I want to. And probably this will be a better way because this way I can build the row and then append it at the end. So this is not the solution to the problem. This is a solution to part of the problem because we've got the number of rows, but we also want to make the number of columns be dynamic. And this is not dynamic. We've got exactly five columns. What if I want seven columns? I want to build this row dynamically. How do we do this? Well, the same exact way I built the whole rectangle, knowing that we have a row. So instead of doing this, now in this block of code, I'm going to build a row. How do I build a row? Well, if I built a rectangle by creating an empty string and then incrementing the rectangle and then having the final value of the rectangle, I can repeat the process for a single row. So I can say let row is equal to an empty string. And then I'm going to loop in order to add asterisk for every column that I have. So another for loop here with let j is equal to zero, j is less than columns, j++. I'm using j as an index because it usually is like that. If you're doing a full loop with one index, you use i as index. If you're doing another full loop inside of it, you use j. And if you have, let's hope not, but if you need another full loop inside of this full loop, you use k, i, j, k, and so on, l, m, n. Don't do too many nested for loops because those are really, really not performance. But now we are looking at how to build a single row. So I'm iterating over the columns and I'm incrementing the row with an asterisk. At the end of this loop, the row will have an amount of asterisks concatenated, which should be exactly the right amount. So that's it. I have the complete row here and I can append it to the rectangle. Don't know if it, if it works, but let's try. I'm going to just add some more spacing here. Let's see if this works. Nope. It didn't log anything. Okay. That is so strange to me. What did I do it wrong? Okay, that's it. I is less than columns. No, it's J less than columns. If I is less than columns, probably I created a loop that will never loop. Not an infinite loop, but a loop that doesn't even start. I don't want even to understand what I did. But in this case, oh, I am looping forever. Okay, I have to close this. I'm going to show you that thing in a while. Let's try again. Now this, this should work. Columns, yep. No, still not working. So I've got an infinite loop somewhere. Okay, I told you I'm tired. So let, uh, this part is valid because it worked before. Let's find this one. Let row is equal to an empty string. J start from zero, less than columns, J plus plus, and I'm incrementing the row. And then I'm adding the row here. So what is the problem here? If I cannot find it, that's a good moment to debug. But if you find the problem before me, you can tell me. Now it seems like it should be working. So let's go to the debug me and I'm going to debug this thing. And let's see what happens. So I'm going to open this index. I think I have it here. It's working. So if it's working, it means that I was probably 
I've got network issues probably. That's the problem. Because everything seems fine here. Are you still with me? Or do we have again technical issues? Any problem? There's something going wrong here. It doesn't, it's not loading. Let's say Google. Not even Google. No, Google is loading. Okay. Uh, dev, dev toe is not, is not loading. But this is also not working. And this looks like an infinite loop. So I think that Chrome is uh, really going to... That happened to me too. I had to close all the pages from Chrome. Okay, cool. So maybe I had... Yeah, maybe I had an infinite loop going on and it was still working. So in that case, yeah, everything is fine. And now I can even uh, make it user... user changeable. So prompt rows prompt columns and now we should have uh, an application that creates a completely custom rectangle so how many rows let's do a big one four columns let's say nine and this is our bigger rectangle yeah, 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 I should have opened all new and this solved. Thanks a lot, Sal. Okay, so this was the rectangle. Pretty easy, but it's a warm-up to understand how it works like when you try to concatenate things and when you want a loop inside of another loop. Uh, so I'm not going to use this. Bobby was mentioning document rights. So Bobby, instead of using the things that we covered in lesson sometimes he watches other tutorials on youtube or tries to google stuff by himself and he already is a little ahead uh, with some concepts he is he used in his solutions some concepts that we didn't cover and some of them i don't even want to cover them uh, but still if you are curious about how bobby created this is something like well, the, no, this is the triangle. Wait a second. This is the rectangle. So let's see what is this code. Rectangle says, let rows is prompt how many rows. Columns, for some reason, is twice the amount of rows. But it can be anything. It's fine. Then, Bobby is going to iterate from one to the number of rows included. And inside of it, is going to iterate over the number of columns included and inside of these two for loops he's using document write. document write is something that i never showed you before because it's also quite uh let's say uh, it's disruptive because if i say document write hello it means that whatever i have in my web page will be completely wiped out and replaced by whatever i write here so, as you can see, what you see here, this daily dev, is a web page, is a web application, and I can see what, it's, what is inside of it. But if I do document write hello, I'm wiping out everything that was inside of this web page, and now it just contains hello. So, that's the reason I don't want to show you this. It's a cool thing to have uh, some text showing here instead of in the console, but still, in real life, you will never use document write because it's too disruptive. You're going to completely wipe out everything you see on the page to show something else. So don't use document write, please. But for the sake of this exercise, we'll, uh, we'll allow it. I'll allow it. And we've got a document write asterisk for every column. This looks a lot like the same thing that we had in our code. We are concatenating asterisks, but instead of concatenating, uh, he's just printing things one next to the other. In fact, if I do document write hello, it looks like this. And if I redo it, it's just going to print hello, appending it and appending and appending. Okay? This is what, it, what document write does. It's, uh, it's a hack. It's a cheat 
for when you don't know how to concatenate strings. So let's go back to this code. This code is not well indented, so we have to indent it a little more, otherwise it won't show that these do two document writes have completely different purposes and they are included in different loops. In fact, all, of, all that you see inside the first four is inside of the body of the four. And all that is inside of this four is just this document write. So now the indentation makes it more clear that inside of the for loop, there's another for loop. And the for loop just does the concatenation of asterisks. But at the end of this internal, of this inner for loop, there is also a document write br. And if you remember, br is the HTML tag that creates a break line. So it goes to a new line. And you can do it because document write is writing in the HTML. So here you can also add HTML tags. Instead of using the backslash n, you can use tags like the br. So if I do this, how many rows? Five. It actually shows what I wanted, but it's also not wiping out the hellos that I have before. So I have to completely refresh the browser and now I can try again. Seven rows. This is it. It works. It is easier to see what is printed and not imagining what the console wants to say, says Bobby. It is true, especially if you're doing console log writes immediately in here, because as you saw, if the console logs are uh, similar, then they get grouped in the, console in, in the console. But if instead you do something like what I've done so far, so concatenating string and then printing the whole console log at the end, then that, that's not a big issue. You can still use the console and, uh, and make it work. Let me show you again. If I build the whole string and with the, also the backslash n and then I console log, this is what happens. Uh, three rows, five columns. This works pretty well. I can even do uh, document writes. Why not? I can do a document write, but I'm doing it at the end. And in that case, I probably need to also refresh the browser, otherwise everything will be appended. But five, seven, ah, oh, it's not working because in the browser I cannot use the backslash n, the new line separator, but I have to use the br as you did. So yeah, it's not going to work well because it's, um, it's going to append things, but if I refresh again, three rows, five columns, and everything looks nice. So yeah, I can use document write, but this is not a good reason to still do a document write in between. Because if you do these document writes in between, you have less, less power. If you instead do all the calculations and then you print everything at the end, this gives you much more power because this way you are, as always, splitting the code into collecting user input, performing the calculations, and then output the results. This is really important as a structure because every single program works like that. And as soon as we start looking at functions, functions are a way to make this even stricter. You collect user input by getting parameters from, the, from outside, you perform the calculations, and only at the end you output the results. Instead, if you're doing console logs or document writes in between, you are mixing two important behaviors in your code, the calculations and the output of the results. So it's really, really important that you start thinking this way. You want to gather input, you want to perform the calculations, and only at the end you can output the results. Because this way, the calculations are not mixed with another concern that is outputting the results. And when you output the results, you separate this concern and you can output it the way you want. You can output it to the console, you can output it in an alert, you can even use document write if you wish to. But you don't have the document write in between inside of these calculations. This bit of calculation also works in Node.js. But when you start using document write or alert, this will only work in a browser environment. So 
if you separate these concerns well, you will have calculations that can be performed anywhere and the output part, which can be, let's say, declined to different environments. So you're making your code more modular, more reusable this way. Okay, it's uh, 12 o'clock my time. Well, it will be in 10 seconds. So we're having a coffee break, five minutes coffee break, and then we'll continue with these exercises. As you can see, it is really, really important to look at these kinds of algorithms because this is the real meat of programming. Then we'll cover other things, but this is really, really important. So see you in five minutes. Bye.
a few moments later. Back again! I don't know you, but I didn't have a coffee, I just stretched my legs. It sometimes wakes me up a little more than coffee. Coffee just gives me... <laughs> gets me nervous. So, let's go back to our code. I hope that what I said so far is clear. Hopefully. Um, if you haven't covered these exercises and you want to have a try at them, and you don't want the solution to be spoiled, please tell me. There's so much time uh, left and we can, uh, we can stop here with these exercises if they are getting too complicated for you and you need some time to digest all these concepts. That's fine. We can even continue with the, the next concept if you want, with the next topic, which is much easier than loops. And then we can go back to loops, uh, exercises on loops. So really, don't worry, whatever fits you. Uh, I'm here to help, not just to speak in front of a camera. Okay, but if I have no feedback at all, I'm just going to continue. So we created a rectangle and the rectangle is about concatenating strings. We started with an empty string we loop over the rows and we concatenate other strings to create a one single row. And once we've got one single row, we can append it to the rectangle. And finally, we've got the complete rectangle to show. Angelo says, I will do the exercises this weekend because I didn't have time, but you can go on. I will just ignore the solutions. Uh, okay, okay. Um, I think that still, if I'm doing the, showing the solution, unless you have a very good memory, you will not completely remember every single thing. So it would still be a, a valid thing to, to try them again. And also the people that did these exercises, maybe you can redo them once again, because, well, you know, practice makes perfect. And with repetition of these exercises, you will get better and better. Uh, you don't need new exercises sometimes. You can just use the same exercises because you just don't remember them. Okay, um, so let's go on with the empty rectangle. The empty rectangle is really similar to the rectangle that we had before, but as you can see, the rectangle is empty, so it has spaces inside and not asterisks everywhere. The first and the last row are full of asterisks, but these ones, no. So how do we do this? Well, again, we have to split the problem into multiple sub-problems. We can say how to build a full row, how to build an empty row, which means a, a row that contains spaces in between, and then how to build the whole, sorry, not button, rectangle, knowing that the first and the last rows are full and all the other rows in between are always empty. We are going to definitely to redo these exercises uh, as soon as we know how to build functions, because with functions, everything is much easier. Bobby says, yeah, I think there is still a lot to learn with loops as I'm doing them to kind of work, but in most cases, what makes them to work is simply magic. Oh, awesome. Okay, so in that case, what can help you really uh, solve the problems without magic, without magic is by stating the problem Clearly, when you understand the problem, then you can find the solution. If you instead brute force your solution, try to add a, a one or a subtract a one and see what happens, well, that's magic. And uh, I can give you a good suggestion, but I don't know if you're ready for this confession that I have. Uh, this is the fourth, 14th lesson that we've done so far, and I always had something hidden in my heart. Um, I have a confession to make. I'm actually an imposter because I don't know anything about programming. There's someone behind the scenes that is suggesting me what to do. I'm just the face of this uh, academy. But there's someone much smarter than me that is telling me exactly how to solve these problems. And I think that it's time that I introduce you this person which is actually the, the real brain of uh, the academy. So please come here and show yourself to the world. There it is. 
This is Miss Quackers, and she is the brain behind all this academy. Uh, well, besides the stupid uh, joke, this has actually um, a base of truth. And the base of truth is called duck, well, rubber duck debugging. Rubber duck debugging, if the network helps me. In software engineering, rubber duck debugging is a method of debugging code. The name is a reference. Well, I don't know why the, the, the images don't load. Okay. Uh, the name is a reference to a story in the book The Pragmatic Programmer, in which a programmer would carry around a rubber duck and debug their code by forcing themselves to explain it line by line to the duck. Many other terms exist for this technique, often involving different, usually inanimate objects or pets such as dog or a cat. Desk check your code is the original term for this technique. Many programmers have had the experience of explaining a problem to someone else, possibly even to someone who knows nothing about programming, and then hitting upon the solution in the process of explaining the problem, in describing what the code is supposed to do, and observing what it actually does, an incongruity between these two becomes apparent. More generally, teaching a subject forces its evaluation from different perspectives and can provide a deeper understanding. By using an inanimate object, the programmer can try to accomplish this without having to interrupt anyone else. So, as you can see, yes, there is some truth behind, behind Miss Quackers. If I need to find a solution, I try to describe the problem to Miss Quackers or to my dog or to whatever. And uh, as soon as I'm able to describe the solution, then, uh, the, sorry, to describe the problem, then the solution becomes evident. So it is really, really important to think out loud, even speak out loud the problem, because that's what's make you, what makes you a programmer that doesn't use magic, but uses uh, real logic. LOL, imagine a programmer sitting there completely frustrated and furious and someone comes by with a rubber duck. Yes, why not? I encourage you to buy rubber ducks or whatever you want. <laughs> that's amazing, says Sal. Okay, so... For example, how do I build this empty rectangle? I speak with my rubber duck and I come up with these kind of hints. Uh, I could say, hey rubber duck, how do I create this rectangle? The rubber duck will tell me, yeah, but what is an empty rectangle? How do you describe me the rectangle that you want to print? Okay, yeah, it's a rectangle that has asterisks on the first row but also on the last row. And in the rows between, it has just one asterisk as the first and the last element, and in between it has spaces. So yeah, probably we have, we need a solution to build a full row for the first one, a full row for the second one, and we have to create empty rows, which behaves slightly differently. And uh, well, the empty rows should be exactly the amount of rows minus two, because we have the first and the last row, which are already covered by full rows. So I'm, tr I'm trying to make up my mind on what this rectangle is and how to, uh, how to approach this problem. Maybe I haven't stated everything completely, but maybe everything will be more clear in the end. Uh, I can start uh, building something that I know how to write, and then once that bit of problem is solved, I can maybe focus on some other parts of the problem. Right? Yeah, I think so. Uh, but first I'm going to drink some water. Which is also another important part of the solution. When you stop and, thi and stop thinking and do something else, um, I don't know, w watch... Uh, watch a TV series or uh, uh, grab a coffee or think about something else uh, or chat with someone else, then your mind goes astray, goes outside of the problem, and at a certain point you will see that the problem is seen from, from far away. From the big, you will see the big picture. Sometimes you get frustrated because you are stuck in the specifics of the problem, but as soon as you wander your mind around, you will have the big picture and you will be able to solve this problem from a new perspective. It happens to me a lot. It happened to me while I was uh, developing my game engine in JavaScript. 
I stopped working on it for multiple days and then at a certain point I was not thinking about the game and I said, oh, maybe I can do it like that. Blah, okay, solve the problem. So it is really, really important. It's not just something stupid that I say because it's, uh, it's fun to say. Okay, so let's split, split the problem into multiple sub-problems. How do I build a full... Hello, living legend, says Club Spinach. Uh, <laughs> Hello to you, Club Spinach. Thank, thanks a lot for your kind words. Um, I don't know if you are someone that I know already, if you're part of the uh, excellent students that I had in the Power Coders program. Are you so high? Maybe not. I don't know. Let's see. Okay, so maybe we can start building a full row. And we know how to build a full row. We can say let or maybe the top row. Yo. The top row, how to build the top row? We know how to build the top row because it's a concatenation of asterisks. We know how to do it. I'm going to redo it again. For let, you know what? In this case, I could use I, but I think I'm going to use J because the I'm iterating not over the rows for, for creating this first row. I'm iterating over the columns. And if I say that the rows are iterated with an index i and the columns are iterated with an index j, I think it's more appropriate to use j here. So I'll use j. j is equal to zero. j is less than the number of columns that were provided somewhere. j++. Yes, I'm a real student which you most likely forgot. What? I never forget my students. Which students are you? Please tell me, I'm really curious. So, let rows equal to three, let columns equal to five. Let's put these here and then we'll ask the user if uh, they want to give us uh, the number of rows or columns. So, I'm iterating over the columns and I'm saying that the top row will be incremented with asterisks. And then I've got it. And well, at the end, probably I also need to add a backslash n in order to go to a new line. So this part is going to build the top row. It's exactly like this. And we can also put some um, some comments to delimit this bit of code. This is the part about the top row. And top row, okay? Something like this. Someone says, um, begin top row and top row you will see pretty soon that these comments although they seem like very useful here to delimit chunks of code can be completely stripped away as soon as as we start looking at functions but for now we don't have know anything about functions so let's keep the comments this is the top row and uh if i know how to build a top row I am probably able to also build the bottom row because the bottom row is exactly the same as the top row. Uh, let's try this code for now. What is this? <laughs> this is not the code that I had in mind. Copy and paste again. Okay, this is the code that I had in mind. And this is my top row. It's five asterisks and then goes into a new line. You can see the new line because the second quote is on the new line. I will, I definitely didn't forget you, but if you're not Asem or Sohaib or uh, Hamza or you're not Antoine, then who could you be? I don't know. You're uh, maybe Shazaib or Noor? Or, you know, there were 20 students. I remember you all and I miss you all. As soon as this shitstorm is ended, sorry for the bad word, we have to meet again, definitely. We already said this in, the, in our chat, in our group chat. Okay, so we know how to do the top row. How do we build the bottom row? Well, it's exactly the same thing as this. And I shouldn't do it, but I'm going to copy and paste. Copy and paste here. And going to say this is the bottom row. This is the bottom row. I'm going to call it bottom row because I don't want to mess it up. And now we know how to build this row here and this row here. But we don't know how to build the two rows in between. But still, now we have a part of the solution. And if we give for... 
yeah, probably I should also console log this stuff. Um, so let's, uh, we have to concatenate all this. So you know what, I'm going to um, build the, I don't know how to do this. Uh, let's, let's create the rectangle, the empty rectangle, because we call it like this, Re empty rectangle. The empty rectangle is the result of adding the top row with the bottom row. It is not true, because between the top row and the bottom row, we need the empty rows, which we don't have yet. But still, at a certain point, we will add them, and I can console log this empty rectangle. Let's see what happens when I execute this code. Okay, yeah, we've got a very stupid rectangle, because it, ha it just has the top row and the bottom row, but no rows in between. So now we can give for granted that we know how to solve a part of the problem so our mind is more free because we don't need to solve the whole problem. We solve this part, we solve this part, we know how to build the whole rectangle knowing that it's comprised of different parts and now we just need to focus on how to build these other rows here, the empty rows. So this is the difficult part here and I'm going to do it in here in this place in between because that's where naturally I would see these row uh, so begin empty rows this is the part where I'm going to talk about the empty rows and this is the end of the empty rows and I'm pretty sure that I will have some variable called let empty rows which starts as an empty string I will add more and more strings and finally I can concatenate the empty rows in here and I will have the whole rectangle if I'm not really sure I can instead of building the the rows dynamically I can hard code them for a start I usually do this when I'm when I'm dealing with a complex problem I hard code numbers like these ones or I hard code even strings and then I try to make them more dynamic. So in this case, for example, empty rows, as I see here, should be two rows with... Uh, how many columns do we have here? One, two, three, four, five, six. So instead, this should be four rows with six columns, actually. And um, so these are six columns, but the first is a string, uh, is an asterisk, the last one is an asterisk, and so we have four spaces, one, two, three, four, four spaces. So if I want to create the empty rows, I should do something like asterisk, space, 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 asterisk, then a new line, then again, asterisk, space, 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 asterisk, and then a new line. These are hard-coded empty rows. I think I got them, but let's see. Uh, I'm going to, again, copy the whole thing, which is really, really annoying. You know what? Instead of copying the whole thing, I'm finally going to, again, use Node.js, because Node.js makes it much easier to, to see all this stuff. So I'm going to my projects, Inglorious Coders, Academy, Inglorious Portfolio, and then I'm on lesson... Uh, Oh, I forgot to create the folder for lesson 14. We are in loops, we are in homeworks, and here we can have a look at these three shapes. The problem with this approach is that I have to now comment out everything I did so far, otherwise it will go in, it's going to print everything. But still, I can do a, let me make it bigger, node of three shapes. Yup, it works. And this could give you a false sense of satisfaction because it looks like the problem is over, but it's not. We hard covered, uh, sorry, we hard coded stuff, and we don't want to have things hard coded. Now that everything is seems like it's working, we have to make this part more dynamic. And we can go step by step, or we can start right away doing for loops. The problem with starting right away is that you could miss some points, and it could start being magic. But a good skill that you can then develop as programmers, as, de as developers, is instead uh, finding the next proper step in order to approach the problem step by step, instead of doing everything at the same time.
So for example, let empty rows is these two strings. Fine. But I can split it into creating an empty string and then concatenating the first empty row and then concatenating the second empty row. I split the whole string into a series of steps. I start with an empty row, then I concatenate an empty, well, I start with an empty string, then I concatenate an empty row, then I concatenate an another empty row. I just, you know, split the execution into three statements and it works exactly the same as before. And then this looks like a repeated thing, which means that probably I can put it in a loop. And the loop goes like this, for this is the number of rows. This will loop for the number of rows that I want to create. So I can do let i is equal to zero, maybe. i is the less than the number of rows, i plus plus. And instead of doing this twice, I'm going to do it only once in the body of the for loop. Will this work? Uh, not exactly. I introduce a problem. If you don't know what the problem is, is that I don't want to iterate over the whole number of rows because I have to take into account that there's a top row and a bottom row that I've already uh, drawn. So these should not be four, these should be two because we have to remove the top row and the bottom row. So how do I do this? Well, I can say just rows minus two. Or if you are uh, if you want to be stricter, you can say that I will start with one because I equal to zero was already covered by the top row. And here we can go to row, rows minus one because the last row was already covered by the bottom row. These numbers have exactly the same meaning. I can say zero and minus two. And this means just that I'm going to count from zero to all the rows minus the top and the bottom one. Or I can do it like this and it has a slightly different meaning. I'm going to start from row one instead of row zero because row zero was already drawn and I'm going to stop at rows minus one because the last row is already drawn as the bottom row. And I said bottom, but it's bottom. So I'll leave it like this. And this is still like before. So we're getting somewhere, but still this row here was constructed uh, hard-coded and I don't want it to be hard-coded. So the last part is to make this part dynamic and now you understand how it goes. If you want to build this thing you have to do something like this. So let's start with, a M with one empty row and the empty row is an empty string and then I want to build this empty row. Actually the empty row will start with an asterisk and end with an asterisk. So in the end the empty row could be written as the asterisk plus whatever I calculated in between plus a final asterisk and even a backslash n. So instead of this, I'm going to declare an empty row as an empty string. I'm going to perform some calculations in order to have the empty row. And then I'm sandwiching the empty row with a couple of asterisks and a new line. So as you can see, the only thing that's left here to do is to add an amount of spaces, which is exactly four in our case. Four spaces because, of, oops, sorry. And then I have to increment the empty rows with the empty row that I just created. You know what? I'm going to add the backslash n here. I think it's uh, nicer. It's exactly the same. Okay, so the code looks the same. What did I do? I said that the empty row is an amount of spaces which is apparently four for some reason. And then the empty row will be sandwiched by these two, uh, th these two asterisks which are exactly one on the left and one on the right. And then I'm going to add the empty row to the empty rows that we had here. So why four spaces? Well, four spaces because four spaces plus two asterisks here means six uh, the number of columns that we have for each row. So just like we did for the rows, which had two full rows and uh, four minus two empty rows, 
In this case, we have an empty row which is comprised of two borders and whatever is left is just spaces. So here we can start with an empty string and we can loop over the columns. Let j starting from zero, j less than uh, columns minus two because we have to take into account that there are a couple of uh, asterisks that we don't care about and then j plus plus. Or if you want to make it more clear, you start at j1 because the asterisk, the first character, was already uh, drawn it's elsewhere and you start at columns minus one because the last asterisk is already drawn elsewhere. And in that case, the only thing that you need to do is to continue concatenating a space to the empty row. You can make it even different. You can start with an asterisk here if you like it better. You can do it like this. So you start with an asterisk, then you append spaces, then you append one last asterisk. If that's your cup of tea, that's fine. Uh, it is exactly the same, and I'm encouraging you to juggle over the possible ways you can write the same thing and achieve the same results. But still, this is working. And you know what? Finally, we got it. It's a complex thing. It's a lot of code. A lot of code. Well, not, not too much. But it's, it, there's no magic in between. We know everything that is happening here. We are beginning with the top row. Then we do a complex scenario about empty rows. And if you don't understand how the empty rows works, we can make it even more clear. This is the begin of one empty row. And it stops here. And then we concatenate that empty row that we created in the string empty rows. And at the end of all, we can concatenate the top row, the empty rows, and the bottom row together. So as you can see, the problem, although complex, was split into multiple sub-problems that we, we, we tried to solve even incrementally, not even, or even iteratively. Uh, so not solving exactly the problem, but getting closer and closer to the solution until we reach the final solution. This code is still pretty ugly to see, and with functions, you will see that the code looks way, way better and doesn't need all those comments. But this is how we, we solve the problem. We asked Miss Quackers how to build a full row yeah, I created the algorithm to build a full row here. How to build an empty row? Okay, this is a problem that I actually uh, solved at the end, but we can solve it immediately. We can think on how to, be, to create an empty row, and this is the code that we would come up with. And then how to build a whole rectangle, knowing that the first and last rows are always full and all the other rows in between are always empty. Miss Quackers is going to tell me that the top row should be should use the algorithm for the full row. Then we have to iterate over the all the empty rows, which is all the rows minus two. And then we have to uh, go with the last row, the bottom row, which is a full row. And then we sandwich everything together and we have the solution. So pretty complex, but still feasible, still feasible. And then we've got other um, other problems here that are a little more complicated, but maybe not, maybe not as complicated as the empty rectangle. Let's have a look at Bobby's rendition of the empty rectangle. Okay, so if you look at Bobby's uh, solution, it is um, similar to mine, but as always, it's simpler and it has a couple of hacks which is fine. So let's see. The rows is prompt how many rows? The columns are rows doubled, but you can also get those from, uh, from the user. He starts from one and wants the i to end at rows included, which makes more sense for a human being because a human being starts counting from one to the rows. But usually programmers start counting with zero. Are you calling me simple? No, not at all. In fact, uh, it's, exa it's exactly the opposite. Uh, 
it is really difficult to find simple solutions. So this, this makes you really clever, not simple. Uh, remember to always to add a let, otherwise you are creating global variables and you don't want to create global variables. Remember to indent your code, otherwise this code is not really that easy to understand. Okay, this looks like a more well indented code and a much more uh, much easier to read and uh, understand. So we're starting with rows and columns and what Bobby says is just a huge if. If i is 1, which means that I'm on the first row, or i is equal to rows, which means I'm on the last row, or j is equal to 1, which means I'm on the first column, or j is equal to columns, which means that I'm on the last column, then in that case I want to write an asterisk. Otherwise, I'm going to write a non-blank space, which should be written like this actually, but it's going to work nonetheless. A non-blank space, if you remember HTML, just creates a hole in the, in the document. It's a space, a non-blank space. And then at the end, of each row, of each iteration of the row, it's going to, it's actually no, okay, at the end of each iteration of the columns, at the end of each row, it's going to go to a new line. This is going to work pretty well, I suppose. Ah, uh, not exactly. Not exactly because in HTML, we are not using the monospace font. Monospace font is a font that is used in the console, which gives every single character the same width. Instead, in the HTML, by default, we are using some other font, which is probably, in my case, it's Ubuntu. But in case there's no Ubuntu, it's, it's going to use Arial or Sans Serif or what else. And those are not monospaced fonts. So if you want to, so as you can see, the space in a non-monospaced fonts is actually uh, thinner than the asterisk character. And this is why it doesn't look exactly uh, there. So Bobby did some research and he found out that there is a special character that we can use. It's a character that is that looks like this, if I can see it in your code. Where's that? Yep, this is it. A character which is escaping U2000. U stands for Unicode, so it's a character borrowed by the Unicode table. It's a special character that has a difference. The difference is that this character will have exactly the same width of the other characters uh, of the asterisk, for example. So if I do this, but I think I have to refresh the browser as always. Five, and as you can see, now the space is much wider. So what is this character? This character, no, it's not a product from Huawei. This character is a Unicode character, as I already told you, and it's an N quad. An N quad is a special character that, as I told you, let me see if there's no, there's no, no description here, but it's a space that occupies the same width of any other character, let's say like this. So it's a trick that we have to use for those characters uh, that for for um, for when we use document write for when we are using the uh, the the document instead of the console. But if we are using the console, there's no need. We can just use a space because a space has exactly the same width as the asterisk. So this solution is really really clever because it's way simpler than the solution that we come with uh, right now. And it's uh, very clever because it just uses these two loops and inside of those loops it just inspects what situation are we in. If we are in the situation of being in the first row or being in the last row or being in the first column or being in the last column, then it's definitely an asterisk. Any other case should have a space instead. This is really clever, and if you need to do just this, that's fine. 
I still see a problem with mixing document rights inside of the whole thing, but you can just change it by concatenating instead of using document rights. So instead of uh, this thing here, let's make it here. So I can ask the, to prompt the columns. How many, oh, still problems with the, still problems with the with the w key um so these two fours i'm going to indent them better as you can see i'm just going to as we say refactor the code so it just behaves exactly the same but it's maybe more readable or it's more powerful it's more flexible but the code behaves exactly the same the solution is correct first of all i'm adjusting the indentation which makes everything much easier to read, write, and of course, also change, debug, etc, etc. And then we can do something like let rectangle is equal to an empty string. And I'm going to concatenate things into the empty rectangle. So I'm going to say rectangle now will hold also an asterisk. And I'm, I need to remember to use the plus equals. If I use equals, I'm replacing whatever is the content of the rectangle with the asterisk, which is not what I want to do. And if I omit the equals, well, this means that I'm just performing this sum, but I'm not storing the result of this sum anywhere. So this is going to not do anything at all, actually. So remember to use the plus equals if you want to progressively increment and concatenate things inside of the rectangle. This is one of the mistakes that you could overlook if you're a beginner or even if you're not a beginner. So watch out, don't omit the equals, don't omit the plus. And here I can uh, do the same. I can rectangle plus equals uh, non-blank space, which in our case, if we really want to print with a document right at the end, it could be this U2000. That's fine for me. And then this other th thing too. I don't want to document right at the end of each row. I want to rectangle plus equals the break of the line. And only at the end, I can document right the whole rectangle that was constructed. Let's see if this works. Nope, on the browser. By the way, when I switched to the terminal, did you see everything? Yeah, yeah, okay. This uh, automatic scene switcher is awesome. I don't even need to care anymore for uh, wh where wh which scene I am in. So, how many rows? Let's say six. How many columns? Eight. And this is exactly the rectangle that we wanted. But this time, the code is slightly different because we've got the user input separated from the calculations, separated from the output. Let's say, just say input. Input, calculations, output. I think this is a little better than just doing the document right in between. And you will see with functions why. Okay, so this is also a clever solution. Um, it doesn't look like magic. Uh, it, I think it's uh, pretty understandable what is going on in this if. Uh, this is much more explicit, and you will see that this explicit thing makes the code a little more powerful because every bit of this code can be placed inside its own function, when we will see functions, and functions can be reused. So when you write code this way, you will start having some sort of Lego bricks that you will be able to combine together uh, in new and different ways. This code here, although it's more performant, although it's simpler, although it's even more readable, probably, but it's not as powerful as the code that we wrote before. So it's not bad, it's not worse than the code that we wrote before. It's better for certain reasons, and it's worse for certain other reasons. There's nothing good or bad in programming. There's only things that are more or less useful to you. Okay, what else, what else, what else? Shall we do the rectangular triangle? 
this is interesting as a solution. Uh, the rectangular triangle looks like the rectangle, but instead every row has a increasing number of asterisks. And uh, as you can see, the asterisks are one, then two, then three, then four, which is exactly the same number of rows that we have. So in row one, we have one asterisk. In row two, we have two asterisks. In row three, we have three asterisks. And in row four, we have four asterisks. I'm saying this and it's pedantic, it's trivial, it's obvious, but this is my way to do rubber duck debugging speaking not to the duck but speaking with you as soon as i speak with you the problem becomes more and more clear to me and i will be able to provide a solution so if you really want to try and find a good solution by yourselves try to teach the solution just like i'm doing just try to tell the problem and the solution will just come to you so let's try um the hint says exactly this it's uh, exactly the explanation that I, that I gave you right now. The number of asterisks is directly proportional to the row number. So if I'm on row zero, well, it's zero plus one. I have one asterisk. And if I'm on row one, well, I have one plus one, two asterisks. Or I can say that the rows start from one and then it's just exactly the same number as the rows. So let's try four let i is equal to zero i is less than rows i plus plus this is the usual recipe i can change this recipe if i want to but at first i just write it blindly what's the number of rows uh, i have to tell let rows is equal to let's start with four four rows just like the example and now i want to concatenate this triangle so let's do a let uh, rectangle triangle it's called rectangle triangle because you probably know it. It's a triangle, it's not a rectangle, but it, ha it has one rect angle in here. That's why it's called a rectangle triangle because it's a triangle, but one of the three angles here is a rect triangle. It's 90 degrees, it's pi half. So let rectangle triangle starts with an empty string and then we want to concatenate as many asterisks as we need for every column. How many asterisks do we need? Well, we have to, again, count them all and add them one by one for each column. So there's no, there's no way we can do this with just the four, probably, with one four. I thought they were called right angle triangle, miserable pi. Miserable pi, <laughs> that's a beautiful nickname. Um, let me see right angle triangle i think you're right it's also called right triangle probably right triangle in american english or right angled triangle in british english but i think that if i say rectangle triangle it will still give me the same thing what is a rectangle triangle it is a triangle yeah it is also a translation from Italian. Yes, I must admit, it's a, we say rectangle triangle in Italian, but I wanted to be sure. So I looked on Wikipedia and somewhere found that I could say rectangle triangle, but probably not. Probably it's triangle rectangle, not, tri not rectangle triangle, but still, yeah, it should be called right triangle. Okay, sorry. That was my Italian thing. So yeah, let's say that this is a, right triangle okay <laughs> right triangle thanks a lot for the clarification i'm still learning especially i'm learning english so um we're ready to start adding the row we have to build the row however how to build a row we know how to iterate over the rows but now we have to build the single row and once we created the row we can just paste it here we can append it to our rectangle triangle and finally be able to console log it. I'm still using the node version, uh, not rectangle. Okay, yeah, rectangle triangle, but I'm going to change the name. Sorry, guys, uh, right triangle. Okay, so how do I build the single row? 
uh, this is the problem that I have to address. So far, I'm able to iterate over the rows, which is kind of basic. Now I have to build a row. So I'm going to loop over the columns. So let j is equal to zero, and j is less than the number of columns. And j is going to be incremented. And in that case, I'm going to say that row will be incremented with a new asterisk. But the problem is, what is the columns? I don't have this uh, variable. I have to stop at the number of columns, but the number of columns is not given right now. In the other exercises, we had a number of columns. It was prompted from the user. In this case, we don't need to ask the user for the columns. In fact, the number of columns for every row changes, varies from row to row, because in row one, we have one column. In row two, we have two columns. In row three, we have three columns, etc., etc. So the number of columns here should be calculated because it's strictly related to the number of rows. And what's the number of columns that we have to put for every row? Well, if we start from row zero, the number of columns should be something like this, should be zero plus one. And if it's row one, it will be one plus one, and then two plus one, et cetera, et cetera. This is what I came up with speaking with my doc. And probably it works, let's see. Let columns is equal to the current row plus one. Because if the current row is zero, the columns should be one. If the current row is one, the columns should be two, et cetera, et cetera. And with that said, probably this is already working, but let's find out. I have to comment out everything else. And let's see if this right triangle works. It works! Yay! But we can change something in here if we want to. For example, we can say that the row starts from one, and then we have to stop right before, or we can just say minus equals rows. And in that case, the number of columns will be exactly the number of rows, because we start from row one, and in row one we have the columns, which is one column, and in row two we'll have two columns, etc., etc. So as you can see, by slightly changing these numbers, I don't even need to say uh, to use the variable called columns. I can just use i in here, because j must always be less than the number of rows. And I think this works exactly the same. Yep. So you can juggle with these variables and how they start, how they end. The problem, as always, is that this makes it a little less standard. Why is this 4 starting from 1 instead of 0, when it, whereas every other for loop that we created so far started with a 0? It's not really clear why j is less than i. Why is it less than i? So, I, rec I encourage you to find, explore different solutions, and then get back to the solution one week later and try to m understand what you wrote. In my case, I would probably be a little more explicit and say columns equal to i plus one. But this is just because this way I'm saying that the loop over the columns requires some calculations for the columns. The columns will be calculated somehow and they are a calculation starting from the number of rows. At least for, for the sake of this, just to make it explicit that the columns are not gotten from elsewhere, but they are calculated at every single row, I would still keep this kind of code. Let's see what Bobby did. Bobby uh, created a bonus here, which I don't remember. I don't remember this one. What, what was that? It's still doing asterisks and breaks. Let, let me see this one, I'm curious. In order to understand this code, someone else's code, first of all, you need to test it. How many rows? Six. Oh, okay, uh, it's doing this. Okay, it's a triangle that is, I, I don't know if you wanted to do exactly this, but yeah, probably yes. So you created a right triangle and it's inverse. Nice. A bonus thing that you can also try at home, guys, um, for next Wednesday, for next Saturday. Um, what else? What else? We've got the... Where is that? 
ISIS. Rectangular something something triangle. Uh, this is Bobby Solution. And Bobby Solution, as always, is very, very plain, very simple, because it has only what we need. This solution says, we have to say let rows, remember, for let i. The reason why Bobby didn't put the lets is probably because he has all the solutions in the same file and these variables were already declared uh, before. So in order to prevent the error generated by redeclaring the same variable over and over, he's just reusing the same variables that were declared above, which is fine. Um, another clever solution from Bobby. So here we've got a four instead of an under four. And as you can see, Bobby's solution is not really that different from the thing that I told you just uh, a while ago. J should be less than or equal than I, because in that case, we are going to stop. Oh, there's plenty of console logs here, uh, however. So I probably have to also document write for the joy of Bobby instead of concatenating stuff. Six, and that's it. This is the triangle. Perfect. Okay, so this is a pretty good solution. It's the second solution that I showed you. And then there's another shape to do, which is the isosceles triangle. And I hope that I didn't mistake this one too. Isosceles triangle. I looked up on it. It's called isosceles triangle. The isosceles triangle is a triangle that has these two um, sides equal. B can also be different, but A and A are equal. So what we want to achieve is something like this one. That looks a little bit like a Christmas tree. And this is a little more difficult because there's uh, some more complex calculations on where to place these asterisks. It's not all about only the number of asterisks, but it's also about the number of spaces that we have to add before starting to draw an asterisk. And as always, I can ask Miss Quackers and I can ask, what, how can I approach this problem? This problem is made of multiple rows and each row must have a special mathematical condition. I told you that we will never do very complex mathematics and this is not complex, it's just sums and multiplications but still it requires a little bit of logic in order to find out what's the proper mathematical rule. So I'm not saying that this is easy, it's not easy at all and in fact these are difficult problems that maybe they are difficult to you now, maybe they will be difficult later on but some someday when you will become experienced developers they will probably not look that difficult, maybe. Or maybe yes, because in the meantime you forgot everything, like I usually do. Um, so, with Miss Quackers, I found a couple of hints that are interesting. The number of asterisks, as always, is directly proportional to the row number, but it's not exactly the same as the right triangle, because every row had a number of asterisks which was exactly the same number as the row number. So one, two, three and four. But in this triangle, as you can see, every row has an odd number of asterisks. We have one, then three, then five, then seven. So there's a slightly different calculations to be, calculation to be performed here. On row one, we have one. But on row two, we have three. And on row three, we have five. And on row four, we have seven. And if we start counting rows from zero, uh, this is the calculation that I came up with. Maybe you will find out the same calculation or a slightly different one, but it should be exactly the same. So on row zero, the row zero will be multiplied by two, and then I'm adding one. And I'm adding this one just like I added one in this, other, uh, in this other exercise. I can also not add one if the row starts from zero. So, sorry, Miss Quackers. Um, I can also have a look at these things like this. One, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four. And as I told you, this could be 
row starting from one, it's one. Row starting from two, it's two, etc., etc. So if I don't start from zero, maybe the calculations are slightly simpler because there's no, not even a, a sum to do. And the same goes here. If you want to know how many asterisks you want to add for each row, you can start with row zero, like this case, or you can probably start with uh, row one, row two, row three, row four, and in that case, of course, you don't need to add a plus one. It will just be a simpler calculation. On row one, you'll have no, not true. One times two is not equal to one. Sorry, this was messed up. No, apparently it doesn't work in this case. Uh, actually, it's, uh, it's giving me a result which is not exactly what I want. It's giving me two, and then it's giving me four, and then it's giving me six, and then it's giving me eight, which are exactly the same numbers that we wanted, minus one. So we need also to subtract one to make things uh, work. So I'm starting to believe that there's no real reason to start from row one in this case. But there's no benefit because if I'm not starting with row zero, I'm starting with row one, I don't get rid of this one. I have to subtract it instead of uh, uh, adding it. So there's no real reason to use row one, row two, row three, row four, and I'm sticking with row zero, row one, row two, row three. So this is already part of the problem as stated as a possible solution. And we can start right away. But if we stop here, this is not going to be exactly the solution that we wanted because this is going to create an, uh, a triangle such as this one with no spaces before. Let's try. It's still part of the solution. So we can start immediately. Let iso triangle, I'm not going to say isosceles triangle, is equal to an empty string. Then I'm going to run through all the rows for let i is equal to zero, i is less than rows, i plus plus. And the rows should be given somewhere. So let rows is equal to, let's say, four, just like in the example. And now I have to build the columns, as we know. So let's say let row is equal to an empty string. As you can see, the recipe is always pretty much the same and we have to just tweak some numbers here and there. But it's still a grid-like scenarios in which we have to iterate over the rows and for each row we have to iterate over the columns. The only thing that change a lot are these statements in the for loops uh, the starting point, the ending point, etc., etc., the increment, and of course, sometimes how you concatenate things together. But it's always the same, the same shape. So we start with an empty row and we then iterate over the columns. J is equal to zero, J is less than columns, J plus plus. And then the row will be incremented with an asterisk. And finally, I can append everything to the ISO triangle by adding the row and possibly also a new line. And in this case, I can just console log the ISO triangle as it is. But the problem is still, how many columns, how many asterisks should I add for each row? I didn't see it here. So I have to write a columns variable that will hold the results of some calculation. And if my calculations here are correct, it looks like I have to multiply the current row by two and then add one. If this calculation is correct, I can just translate it into code and that's it. The current row times two plus one. Let's see if this works. I have to comment out this in order to make it visible on Node. And I got it wrong because I forgot a plus. I'm sorry, I had to concatenate row and the backslash n. Okay, this doesn't look like what I had in mind. It looks like the triangle that we had before, but the number of asterisks increased. Here the asterisks are 1, 2, 3, 4, and here the asterisks are 1, 3, 5, 7, which is exactly the number of asterisks that I expected here. So we are close to the solution. We're not over, 
but we are close. The thing that the other hint that I have to use now is the number of spaces. How do I calculate the number of spaces to put before each asterisk to make those asterisks centered as an isosceles triangle? So the second hint that I found by just discussing with Miss Quackers here is the number of spaces is inversely proportional to the row number. In fact, in uh, row number zero, I've got three spaces. In row number one, I've got two spaces. In row number two, I've got one space. One space. And in the last row, uh, row number three, I'll have zero spaces. So how do I calculate this thing? Well, if you remember the exercise about the countdown in which you can, let, let's, let's get back to the countdown. Um, where was that? Yeah, this is it. Here, we wanted to count from 10 to 0, and we did it in two ways, either counting from 10 to 0, or counting from 0 to 10, and then printing 10 minus the current number. This allows us to count straight, but then have a number which is decreasing and inversely proportional. This is much easier, in, because you are counting from right to left, let's say. And both the solutions probably work in this case, in the case of shapes. But let's start with the, with, the, with the countdown with the inverse. So as I said here, I just have to take the last row, and the last row is the row number three, minus the current row. Because last row, if I say that this is, the, the rows are four, the last row is row number three. 0, 1, 2, and 3. The last row is 3. And the current row is 0. So how many spaces do I have to give? Well, 3 minus 0 is 3. In fact, I need to put 3 spaces. And in row number 1, I'm still subtracting the last row, which is 3, minus the index of the current row, 1. 3 minus 1 is 2. And in fact, I have to put 2 spaces. And in here, I have to put 1 row, uh, one space, and finally zero spaces. So this easy subtraction seems to be working. Let's apply it. Before even adding asterisks, I want to add some spaces. And I'm going to do it here. Let spaces ah, is equal to how many spaces? Well, if that calculation is correct, I have to do something like get the last row number and the last row number is uh, last row is equal to the number of rows minus one because if I have four rows the last row will have an index of three and if I have five rows the last row will have an index of four because we're we're counting from zero as always so last row is rows minus one and spaces will be last row minus the current row Apparently, because this calculation seems correct and Miss Quackers agrees. So now I can just do another for loop in which I iterate J from zero to the number of spaces that we want to add, J++. And in that case, instead of adding asterisks, I'm adding spaces. And it could work. And it does. As you can see, the spaces are correctly added. I'll probably leave to you as an exercise, how do I, how can I create this other for loop in another way, knowing that you can count down, either counting from uh, zero to 10 and then doing the subtraction, or you can count from 10 to zero and do no subtraction. So I'll, I'll leave this to you. So we're now able to do the isosceles triangle and I think that yeah there's another example here which is the reversed isosceles triangle I'll leave this to you and if you want to you can even create a oh, again how's it called in English a hourglass not not hourglass a hourglass you can create an hourglass by just combining the inversed isosceles triangle with the, the right isosceles triangle and you can make a shape which is similar to the hourglass. So if you want to 
to have a look at it, well, the hourglass made by triangles, not these one which are more rounded. I don't care about rounded. So this could be your last exercise. We've got still 50 minutes or so. So there's another thing that I really, really care to, uh, to include in this lesson, which is the exercise about prime numbers that we haven't finished last Wednesday. It's a long one, so I'm not really sure that we can finish it today, but I'll try to. And there's also Sal's Quest, but uh, if you want to have a look at Sal's Quest, it's in the repository, so you can have a look at it. I even probably shared it on Discord. Hopefully. Uh, where's that? JavaScript. Yeah, we've got Sal's Quest here. So you can challenge yourself with Sal's Quest too. It's really similar to one of the warm-ups, but still, it's a new exercise. And the one that I really care about is the prime numbers, because this is probably one of the most complex algorithms that we, can, that we saw so far. Prime numbers means that we want to iterate over the numbers up to max num, a number provided by the user, or hard-coded as a variable, what you, what you want. And you just want to print all those numbers in that sequence, which are prime. And you want to discard all the numbers that are not prime. This is not an exercise that I came up with. This is one of the tasks that you have in the loops section of JavaScript.info. Output prime numbers. And if you look at the solution, don't look at it right away. But if you look at it, the solution, you will see that it uses a continue, if I remember correctly. Not a break, but a continue. And I don't want to use continues and breaks because they make our code less readable. So I'm going to find a... Easy, it took me only six hours, says Bobby. Um, so I'm going to try an, to attempt a solution which doesn't use any, um, any break conditions, any untils, any, con any continue, and I'm trying to make it as not magic as possible, okay? So what I'm going to implement is one of the most ancient algorithms out there. It was invented even way before computers were invented. And you know that algorithm is just, it just means that it's a series of steps in order to get to some solution to a problem. And this was created by, allegedly, by Eratosthenes. No, I'm pretty sure that I got it wrong. Eratosthenes. In fact, it's era, ah, it's Eratosthenes. The H is here. Sorry, Eratosthenes. I already solved my quest with the explanations of the other exercises today, so awesome. Let's see if uh, the other students will be able to do so, but good job. Uh, so we have to implement the sieve of, Eratos of Eratosthenes, which is difficult to say, and the sieve is really, really simple. You start running through all the numbers from two to max number, and for every number, you check if the number is prime. If it's prime, you print it. If it's not prime, you don't print it. So this is already one thing that we can start writing. We can say uh, let max num is equal to let's say 10 and then we run through all the numbers and I say let number starting from 2 to the max number and I'm going to increase the number. And if the number is prime, I'm going to print it. Otherwise, I'm not going to print it. So in pseudocode, I can say something like if is prime, then print it. Otherwise, don't print it. So I'm not doing anything. And this is already a good approach. The problem is how do I know if a number is prime? And that's the difficult part. Because a prime number is defined as a, a number not divisible by any of the previous ones. Which means that in that case, if I have the number 5, I have to run all the previous numbers of 5, starting from 2. So 2, 3 and 4, which are the previous numbers of 5. And then I have to see if 5 is divisible by any of these three numbers. 5 is not divisible by 2, by 3 or by 4, so 5 is prime. But if I use 6, then I have to run through all the previous numbers of 6, which are 2, 3, 4, and 5, 
And as soon as I inspect 2, well, 6 is divisible by 2, so 6 is not prime, and I have to discard it. This is the difficult part, but I hope that with all the warm-ups that we've done today, maybe this will not be completely magical to you. So, we have to run through all the previous numbers, starting from 2, and we have to check if the current number is divisible by the current previous number. And to make sure that the current number is divisible by the current previous number, uh, we have to see if uh, dividing the number from the previous number will give us a remainder of 0, which we already know. So, to, to know if this number is prime, we have to do another for loop. The for loop gets all the previous numbers from 2 to the current number excluded, because of course the number is divisible by itself and we don't want to check that. We want to check if the number is divisible by any of the predecessors and previous should be incremented. So this, this way we can iterate over all the previous numbers. And we want to check if the number is divisible by any of the previous ones. So I can say if the number is divisible by the previous one, which means that the remainder of the inter integer division gives me zero, then I have to do something. Bobby says, wouldn't it be easier to start from three and step plus two as all even numbers can be discarded? Yes, but in that case you could say the same for uh, all numbers that are multiple of 3, or 4, or 5, etc, etc. So, it's good as an optimization, but we don't really care about optimization. This would be a premature optimization, and as we already said, premature optimization is the root of all evil. So, let's not focus on these optimizations. Uh, we should probably never care about these optimizations. So, what do I do if the number divided by previous is zero. Well, in that case, I'm certain that the number is not prime. So we can just discard the number and that's it. Or since we started saying that there's a variable here called is prime, if there is such a variable, we can definitely say that is prime is false because I found one number that can that number can be divided with. I don't know. <laughs> uh, it's really difficult. But what is the initial value of this variable? Is prime is now false. So do I have to assume that this variable was uh, true before? Well, yes, probably yes. So this is the part of the loop that checks if the number is prime. So we can even uh, collapse this in Visual Studio Code and not care of what is inside of this loop. I know for sure that if I run through all the previous numbers and I, found, and I find one, the number can be divisible, can be divided by, then I will say that no, uh, this number is prime. So the last thing that I need to do is to give for granted that the number is prime. So let's have a look at this. I'm iterating over the numbers and for each number I'm going to say, let's assume uh, as an absurd that this number is prime. But then I run through all the previous numbers and I find out that there is one number this number can be divided by. So I was wrong, is prime becomes false. And at the end of this check, if now I, is prime is still true, because this if condition never happened before, then I've I'm going to console log the number. Otherwise, is prime is false for this current number, and I'm going to discard it. And then for each successive number, um, I'm still going to start with the same assumption. Now, I want to check if this current number is prime, and then I want to see if it's really true, and then I'm going to uh, console log the results. Let's see if this works out of the box. Max num is 10, so I should see 2, 3, 5, 7. 2, 3, 5, and 7. And if I do it with, uh, I don't know, 15, 
it also includes 11 and 13. So as you can see, the code is not really that difficult, but there is a very, very important concept in here. The concept is the concept that I'm trying to tell you uh, since the beginning of this academy, and this is starting to become more relevant now because we are looking at the same concept applied in programming. It is the scientific method. In the scientific method, and finally I'm going to show you these memes, uh, let me open the image in new tab. You probably saw this image already. In the scientific method, you start with an observation of a phenomenon. Then you question, why is, it, is this working like this? Then you formulate a hypothesis. And based on the hypothesis, then you do a prediction. You expect that if an apple falls from a tree, that if an apple falls fell from a tree, then you predict that another apple will also fall from the tree. Because there must be some connection between trees, apples, and the fact of falling. So you do experiments to prove that your assumption is correct, that your hypothesis is correct, and finally you get a result. This is pretty wrong, actually. This is pretty wrong because of two things. First of all, the process is not so linear. So instead of looking at this meme, let's look at this other meme. This other meme is a little more precise because you start with an observation, you perform some question. Why, is the, why did the apple fall from the tree? You formulate a hypothesis, you create a prediction, you do an experiment, you find results. But now the results could be either positive or negative. And if the result is negative, so you see uh, an apple that is actually falling up, then you have to reject your initial hypothesis and you have to adjust your hypothesis. You have to come up with a new hypothesis or even change it slightly sometimes. Then you have to perform new predictions, new experiments and get new results. And if the results still contradict your hypothesis, then you have to go back to reformulate and adjust your hypothesis until at a certain point your results cannot reject your hypothesis and so you, your hypothesis becomes a theory, becomes the truth until proven wrong, as always. In science, any theory is true until proven wrong. The theory of gravity is true until proven wrong because nobody was able to create an experiment that disproved the theory of gravity. So gravity is a theory. And there's so many other scientific uh, theories out there that are still true until proven wrong. In fact, some theories, some very important theories, were proven wrong at a certain point. For example, well, the theory of gravity itself, I don't want to say it, it was proven wrong, but Newton's gravity is just a subset of the gravity that general relativity uh, describes. So Einstein expanded on Newton's uh, theory. It was not completely rejected, but it was expanded. And the same is with quantum physics. Quantum physics is a huge expansion and a very hard to understand expansion to classical uh, physics, to classical mechanics. But it's not rejecting the hypothesis. It's just giving you new insights and so it's giving you new information so we can know things better. And then, yeah, of course, we can go back to observe other, um, other phenomenons in physics. Why am I telling you this? Because there's a small, very subtle problem in here. I said that you have to create experiments that prove your hypothesis. This is the wrong, the wrong part of what I said so far. The experiments should never prove your hypothesis. The experiments should try to contradict your hypothesis. Only in that case, you will have new uh, insights, new information. Because if you say that the sky is blue and then you create an experiment to prove that the sky is blue, but the experiment is just looking at the window every single day during summer, you will say, yes, of course, the sky is blue. But the only experiment that can reject your hypothesis is an experiment that disproves the fact that the sky is blue. For example, if you look at the window by night, 
then you will say, oh, the sky is not always blue. Sometimes it's black. It's pitch black because there's no light in there. Or sometimes you look at the window and uh, in a cloudy scenario, just like this one, because it's raining, it's cloudy in Italy right now. And in that case, you will say, oh, the sky is not always blue. Sometimes it's gray. Okay, so the experiments that you do should always try not to prove your hypothesis because they, they don't provide any new information. They're completely useless. The experiments that you, that you do should try to disprove, to reject your hypothesis. And only once you created a huge amount of experiments, you, can, you say, okay, I'm not able to reject my hypothesis anymore, so my hypothesis should be true. And this makes it a theory. Why am I saying all of this? Because of two reasons. Three. First of all, this experimental approach will help you a lot in programming. Two. This uh, experimental approach will help you a lot in life. In fact, in life, we are always surrounded by people who don't apply this method and they are conspiracy theorists. In fact, they start from the assumption that the Earth is flat and they try to do experiments that prove that the Earth is flat, and those experiments actually confirm that the Earth is flat. But those flat earthers should always create experiments that disprove that the fact that the Earth is flat. And these, if these experiments do, can, are not able to reject that hypothesis, then yes, we can probably say that the Earth is flat. But unfortunately, we did it already, and we did it on the opposite side. We started with the assumption that the Earth was flat, but then someone said, hey, what if it was not flat? Let's try to disprove this hypothesis. And in fact, they created an experiment that tried to disprove the hypothesis that the Earth was flat. And in fact, we had to reject this hypothesis and come up with a new hypothesis. Maybe it's not flat. Maybe it's round. It's not even perfectly round. It's a geode. But still, as you can see, the scientific method allows you to find the truth by always asking yourself, what if I'm wrong? What if my assumption is not correct? And the third reason why I'm telling you this is because we applied this scientific method in programming, in coding. This is the application of the scientific method. I'm, I'm, I'm starting with an assumption. I'm assuming that this number is true, is prime. Is it true? I don't know. Let's try to disprove it. Let's try to find a case, one number, that disproves my hypothesis. As soon as I find that there's a number that disproves my hypothesis, I have to change my initial knowledge of this number and say that, no, I was wrong. The number is not prime. And at the end of the loop, once I performed all the possible experiments that I could possibly do, now I have the real solution. Now I've got my theory. The number is or is not prime. Because I started with an assumption, then I tried to disprove my assumption. In some cases, the assumption was disproved. For example, four. I start by saying it's prime, but then I found two, which is a divisor of four. So I have to say, no, I was wrong. The number is not prime. Or sometimes my hypothesis is true. So for example, seven, and uh, running through all the numbers from 2 to 6, 2, 3, 5, 4, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, none of the previous numbers could divide the current number, the number 7. So my assumption was correct. And then I'm using this information later on. So as you can see, this scientific approach is really, really important. In every case, you apply it when programming, when trying to find a solution, you're applying in life, and it's part of some uh, algorithms that we do in programming. Those algorithms are usually search algorithms. They are algorithms in which you have to look at uh, a collection of things and check if uh, at least one element satisfies your condition or if all of the elements satisfy your condition. And we will get back to this when we are looking at arrays, because it's uh, way easier to see uh, with arrays. Bobby, no, Bobby, is. Uh, it was, it was uh, the old message. So I hope that you understood this thing that I told you, and I hope that this code will make, will make 
much more sense to you than the code that I'm going to show you right now. This is the solution of output prime numbers performed by this tutorial. There are many algorithms for this task. Let's use a nested loop, says uh, javascript.info. For each i, so the, num the current number in the interval, check if i has a divisor from 1 to i. I wouldn't say from 1. In fact, then it uses 2. So stupid to say 1. Um, if yes, the value is not a prime. If no, the value is a prime, then show it. Bobby says, I'm a bit annoyed that this sieve could be could have been done so easier. Looking at it now, mine looks confusing. And I'm going to also look at your, your sieve right now. But let's have a look at this too. So the code is going to use a label. And uh, a label is a strange thing that I didn't want to really show you. But if you use the continue uh, keyword, you can continue to some label that you placed somewhere. This is really, really ugly. This is exactly the same Thing that we used to use to, to do in uh, languages, low-level languages such as assembly or probably even Visual Basic, uh, the Commodore language, which I don't even remember, probably it's basic. And those were languages in which you could jump from one piece of the code to some other subroutine elsewhere. And this jumping here and there makes the code really, really confusing. That's why I usually completely recommend not to use continue breaks and especially not these labels. So what they say here is that as soon as we find that the number is divisible by one of its predecessors, then stop here and continue the loop. So avoid the alert and go back to, to inspect another number. And then only if uh, the number is not divisible by any of the predecessors, then I will never incur into a continue, so it's going to alert the prime number. But this is very confusing, and I think it does exactly the same thing as my code is doing, but my code is a little, probably, more explicit. It's starting with an assumption, is looking for a number that disproves my assumption, and then it does something with the uh, with the new inform with the information that we came up with, searching for something. If, if if I find it, then good. I'm going to print it. If I'm not, if I didn't find it, I'm not going to print it, or vice versa. Um, let's see what they say. There's a lot of space to optimize it. For instance, we could look for the divisors from two to square root of i. So Bobby, as you can see, there are some optimizations that we can do. In fact. Not only we can start with uh, from from two, uh, start from three and step for uh, and step by two, but we could also stop way before the number n. We could stop at the square root of n, because of course the if I have the number twenty five, I don't need to look at all the predecessor of twenty five up to twenty four. I need to look at the predecessor up to square root of 25. 25 square root is 5, so I can have a look at all the numbers from 1 to 2 to 5 uh, in order to, to see if uh, 25 is prime or not. But still, who cares about these optimizations? Uh, for now, we are looking at the logic behind it, not at the maths. And I think that this logic is pretty clean and pretty non-magic. But you can tell me uh, if uh, you don't agree with that. And uh, let's have a look at Bobby's solution. Sieve of something. So let's copy it and put it in on the, on the console log here. As always, I'm adding indentation because the code like this is really, really difficult to, to read. And there's no need to make things difficult. Um, you don't want to be that kind of smart ass that says, oh, if you cannot read it, then you're not smart as me. No, you want your code to be readable. Because as we already said multiple times, every fool can write code that a machine can understand, but only a few people can write code that a human can understand. So. The challenge here, especially with simple problems, but 
of course, also with uh, complex problems, is that you want your solution not only to work, so to be interpreted correctly by the machine, but also to be readable by a human being. That human being, most of the times, being yourself in a couple of weeks, in a couple of months, or your colleagues, your teammates sometimes. So the sieve of something is like this. Let input prompts a number. So we are going to... Uh, yeah, to create all the uh, numbers up to a certain uh, input. Then there's a selected input, which is also equal to input. So we create another variable that starts as input. And uh, for some reason, I see that here the input should less be less than or equal than the selected input. So two things could have happened. Either the input changes its value somewhere, yes it does, or the selected input changes its value, which is not our case. So what happens here is that maybe there's a little bit of confusion. The input was used first to get a number from the user, which was the selected input, so uh, the, the, the max number, let's say, and then the input were, was uh, recycled into something else. It was recycled into all the numbers from one to the selected input. This makes things a little confusing. So I'm going to change the variable names and just by changing the variable names, things get a little less confusing. So this can be, if you want selected input or we can say max number. So this is the limit to which we want to look for our prime numbers and it will go here too. And there's no other place in which I have to put it. And then this selected input can be completely removed probably because we can say let input start from one and we do things. This input, um, no, this variable name is also not really good. Uh, this is the current number up to max number. If you don't want to say just number, we can say the current number to make it even more explicit. This is the current number in the loop and I have to put it in multiple places, probably this. So we are looping the current numbers from one and I'm telling you the number one will already be discarded because one is not considered a prime number. We have to start with two because this is the sieve of Arathosinus. This is how prime number works. Um, then uh, we, are, we are doing this until max number included which is fine, or you can do it excluded if you want to, that's exactly the same. And here you are iterating again with a variable that was never declared before, so what, watch out, uh, from two to current number minus one included, which is exactly the same as saying less than current number, which is a little less verbose and a little more, and a little more clear probably. And uh, this i looks a lot like my previous number, my current previous number. We can call it previous number if you want to. Uh, we can call it i, that's fine. But if you want to make sense of your code, especially if uh, uh, you are wrapping your head around some difficult algorithm that you cannot understand, then in that case, naming variables will help you a lot. So now we are saying that if the current number is divisible by the previous number, then here is where the, I won't say the magic, but here's where things are a little more dif a little different than the solution that I found. Uh, here, there's a temporary variable that has a value of zero, and temporary variable gets incremented for every number that this current number can be divided with. And only if temporary is equal to zero, it means that I could not find any, uh, any previous number that could be divided, um, that the current number could be divided with, so the current number is prime. If temporary is zero, then the, temp the, the, the current number is prime. And this is exactly the same solution as mine, but in my solution, I used a Boolean value, and the Boolean value of uh, zero is false, and anything that is not um, uh, that is not zero becomes true. 
So if you call this temporary, which has no real meaning, um, you can call it something like... Um, I don't want to say it's is not prime. Let's say is not prime, okay? Let is not prime is equal to zero. Then is not prime, or you, you know what? No, we can call it divisors. This is much better. So the number of divisors of this number is zero at first. But then the divisors gets incremented by one. We can even say plus plus. The as soon as I find a divisor, the divisors increment. And if I could not find any divisors, so divisors is equal to zero, then it means that the number is prime. The only thing that I would also add is that divisors should be in the first for loop because, oops, this should be in the first for loop because you want to reset the number of, oh God. Ah, oh, sorry, I had, I mistook it. Okay, it's really difficult to write code in, uh, in the console. So, I have to reset the number of divisor for every current number that I want to inspect. So, in this sieve, I'm not looking if the, for a prime number. I'm looking for how many divisors a number has. I'm assuming, at first, that the current number has no divisors. Then, I'm iterating over all the previous numbers, and if I find one divisor, I'm incrementing the number of divisors. At the end of the loop, if there are no divisors, it means that the number is prime. So I can write uh, the current number. This temporary is equal to zero has no reason to be here if the divisors are declared in the for loop. If you declare the divisors outside of the for loop, then yes, you have to explicitly reset this number. But if uh, divisors is instead inside of this for loop, well, as soon as you perform a new iteration of this for loop, the number of divisors is automatically uh, reinitialized because this variable was created in the scope of this for loop. So at every iteration, this variable gets redeclared and reassigned the value zero. As you can see, this solution is exactly the same as mine, but I'm just looking for uh, the answer to a question. And the question is, is the number prime? While well, your question is a different one. How many divisors does the number have? If the divisors are more than zero, then it's not a prime. If the divisors was still zero, then it's a prime. But as you can see, the logic is exactly the same. You start with assumption, and then as soon as you find one experiment that disproves your assumption, you are ready to change your belief and then do with that new, uh, new information whatever you want to do. So let, let's, find, let's try this one. The number is 10, and it's showing me two, three, five, seven. So this works exactly the same. I just refactored it a little bit by especially changing the variable names, but your solution is not much more complex than mine. It was exactly the same. The only thing that was probably very, very different is the fact that, um, yeah, you, you had to reset this temporary value, but just because you declare this temporary value outside of its intended scope. If you just put the let inside of the first four, you don't need to reset it. And uh, I also left you last Wednesday with a game, which is not a real game, it's a stupid game. It's a social game that I discovered the first time watching a YouTube video from the channel Veritasium, which I really recommend. It's a huge, beautiful uh, channel. And then I also read a book, which is called The Black Swan. Really important, especially nowadays. And the game is like this. It's a social game. It's not a mathematical game. I'm going to present it to you again for those of you who were not there last Wednesday. The social game goes like this. I have a sequence of numbers that follow a rule that I only know. Are you seeing the, the chat? Yes. Perfect. So the sequence that I have in mind is 2, 4, 8. And you can guess the rule that I have in mind, or you can give me another sequence of numbers. So this is an experiment that you are performing. And it can be any numbers, not only a continuation of my sequence. And this sequence of numbers that you give me 
should provide some insight on the solution because if you give me the sequence of numbers I can tell you this sequence follows my rule or this sequence does not follow my rule. What happened is that Bobby proposed this sequence of numbers 16, 32, 64 and I said that this sequence follows my rule. So Bobby tried to guess what my rule was. Since we have two sequences 2, 4, 8 and 16, 32, 64 it looks pretty natural to say that the rule is powers of 2. In the sequence every successive number is just the, uh, the, the next power of 2. But that's not the rule that I have in mind. Those two sequences follow my rule but that's not the rule that I have in mind. And another attempt was is that the current number is uh, the previous number doubled or the previous number summed with itself? Well this is exactly the same as saying power of 2 so no it's not that rule that I had in mind. Then Sao proposed two sequences. One is 12, 8, 24, which is not powers of 2. So this is already disproving the hypothesis that the sequence was a sequence of powers of 2. And then she gave 30, 34, 36, which again, it's not uh, a sequence of powers of 2. So what I would come up with this sequence is okay so maybe it's not powers of 2 but maybe it's uh, even numbers because all these are even numbers and all these are even numbers and all these are even numbers so my guess with these sequences would be even numbers but that was not Sao's guess Sao in fact got the right solution and and there we got stuck because Sao's solution was correct but it was a guess. It was a guess just like Bobby's guess. Bobby said powers of 2 and it was not correct. Sao proposed another rule and it was not correct. And it was correct, I'm sorry. But the correctness of this solution was not totally proven by these numbers. Because these numbers follow Sao's rule and so also mine. But they do not exclude any other rule. For example, the fact that the numbers should just be even. So this is a social experiment that is intended to show people how we human beings are subject to certain kinds of cognitive biases and one of them is called confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is a tendency to search for, interpret, favor and recall information in a way that confirms or supports one prior beliefs or values. People display this bias when they select information that supports their views, remember flat earthers, ignoring contrary information or when they interpret ambiguous evidence as supporting their existing attitudes. So if Sao was biased, and she's not, she would say, hey, my ruler was correct because my sequences prove that my assumption is correct. And she would be wrong, but Sao didn't say this because Sao is not biased. Uh, these, rule, these sequences do not prove that uh, Sao's rule. And they do not prove even the fact that the number should be even. What can prove your assumption is a sequence that instead disproves your assumption. So if you have an assumption in mind, for example, the number should be even and you provide these two sequences, well, these two sequences do not disprove your assumption. They prove your assumption and they don't give you any new information. You want to find a sequence of numbers that instead disproves your assumption. Let's see if there's anything to say about this uh, confirmation bias. Uh, people display this bias when they select information that supports their views. The effect is strongest for desired outcomes, for emotionally charged issues and for deeply entrenched beliefs. Confirmation bias cannot be eliminated entirely, but it can be managed, for example, by education and training, here I am, in critical thinking skills. So what happens usually is that you have an assumption and you really care for this assumption to be true. You want that assumption to be true. And if someone asks you for proof, you just provide proof that, uh, that, that actually is in favor of that assumption. Because you want 
you don't want to have the negative feeling of saying no i was wrong no that assumption is is wrong so confirmation bias is really really uh, in ourselves and uh, it's still in uh, action in this game can somebody not tell me what the solution is because i don't really care about the solution i care about the experiment the important part of this social game is not the outcome it's the experiments that we do we want to find the proper experiments that prove our outcome not the solution and once you found the solution it's also pretty difficult to find the proper experiment that proves the the outcome so I don't know if you want to give it a try right now in the last 10 minutes of our, of our lesson or if I can guide you through this uh, solution. Did I have any... Uh, no, prime numbers, shapes, warm-ups, so... So again, I have... Oops. I have a sequence of numbers, two, four, eight. These numbers follow a rule, but the rule is hidden, is secret. I only know it, and Sao too, and all, the, all those who attended uh, Wednesday, last Wednesday lesson. Uh, so, 248 is the sequence that I have in mind. Some people tried adding 16, 32, 64, and decided that maybe this is powers of 2. Of 2... No, this is not the rule. Then some other people decided to add other numbers such as 12, 18, 12, 18, 24, and also 30, 34, 36. And then they found out the rule, but the rule was just a guess, just like the powers of two. The rule that I would come up with with this experiment is Mm, incrementing, uh, I don't know, even numbers, even numbers, because these numbers are all even, and I would say no. So all these sequences are correct, they follow my rule. And the problem with those sequences is that they prove your assumption, if the assumption is powers of two or even numbers. Now we found out that it's not powers of two, and the rule is not even numbers. If you're stuck with the assumption of even numbers, you would come up with uh, two, four, six, eight, even four numbers. And I would say, yes, this proves, this follows my rule. But still, the rule that I have in mind is not even numbers. And there's people that still say, okay, so it's uh, 16, 32, 24. No, they're still sort of powers of two or even numbers. All these sequences do not provide any new information. Maybe one new sequence could be adding some uh, numbers that do not follow the hypothesis that you have in mind. For example, in this last sequence, 30, 34, th uh, 34, 36, what if you do 30, 33, 34? Then this is an experiment that gives you new information because I'm saying, well, this is still following my rule, but now this sequence is completely different from any other sequences. Why? Because it has a number which is different. It's an odd number. It's not an even number. So you can say, okay, is it all numbers? Because apparently I can put, uh, I can put even numbers, I can put odd numbers, what else do I have? Well, no, it's not this. So you can say, okay, let's probably it's not negative numbers. So I'm getting rid of the assumption that they are just need to be all numbers. Maybe it's just positive numbers. So I'm creating an experiment that is trying to give me this information. Uh, are negative numbers included? Let's find out. Minus six, minus four, minus two, for example. This follows my rule, but it's not about positive numbers, because this is a sequence that follows my rule. So no, it's not even uh, just positive numbers. But as you can see, now we're starting to add some new experiments that are giving us new information. 
It's not powers of two, it's not even numbers, it's not all the numbers. If you still go with the four, six, eight, you're giving me an experiment that has that gives me no extra information other than the all the other experiments, all the other experiments that proved it was even numbers. It's not even numbers. So this experiment is useless. So at a certain point, someone could come up with uh, six two four. And this is different because, yes, they are even numbers, but they are not in ascending order. So we can say, oh, and this does not follow my rule. Finally, I'm telling you that there is a sequence that do, does not follow my rule. 3, 2, 1 follows the rule, says Tiago. 3, 2, 1. Does it follow the rule? No, it doesn't follow my rule. So Tiago found out one experiment, finally, that disproves any of the hypotheses that you had so far, or maybe you formulated a hypothesis and you're now trying to prove that hypothesis, but especially now you found a sequence for which I'm saying, no, this does not follow my rule. When I say that the sequence does not follow my rule, finally you've got some new information because every other sequence that followed my rule didn't tell you that much. But now that we have a sequence that doesn't follow my rule, now you've got some information and you say, oh, three, two, one is in descending order. So it, should they be all ascending? Yes, it is. So my rule was just any number but in ascending order. And this was uh, randomly placed numbers because these are not even uh, randomly placed. No. So this final experiment by Tiago was the key to the solution. This disproved my, my sequence, in my rule. I said that this does not follow my rule. So finally, you have this new information available. Okay, so social experiments. Not, not a mathematical experiment because it's pretty easy to come up with a rule such as ascending order or descending order. It's not probably even that mathematical. But still, as you can see, this uh, game, this social experiment, uh, is uh, meant to prove to you that all we human beings are biased in mel multiple ways. In fact, I encourage you to go to cognitive bias on Wikipedia. And uh, it's a really interesting read, I think, because we have so many cognitive biases uh, going on in our mind every time. And among these, there's the confirmation bias, which is the tendency of to search for, interpret, focus on, and remember information in a way that confirms one's preconceptions. But the real, the real advancement, the real progress is when we get rid of this need to confirm our preconceptions. And instead, we do exactly the same. We get humble and we say, what if I'm wrong? What if my preconception was false? So only in that case, you will find the proper experiments that will open your mind. Somewhat misleading, as I thought the number should be a continuation of some sort of what you started with. And I'm sorry for this misleading thing, but I said any numbers, not only a continuation of my sequence. I said it last Wednesday and I said it today too. So <laughs> you, probably <clears throat> you probably didn't see that. Anyway, I think that uh, we can stop here for today. There was already a lot and I would encourage you to continue these uh, exercises, maybe redo them if you've done them already. Maybe next time we will see also Saul's quest. I'm sorry if I didn't put it in this lesson. And then after next Wednesday, we are finally going to do some new stuff, functions, arrays, etc., etc. I actually have no idea what to do next Wednesday because we ran out of tasks and we all almost ran out of uh, homework. So I probably need to either come up with some new homework or, uh, or maybe it can be a more interactive uh, session in which you guys can ask me things and uh, tell me your doubts or whatever. No, it was when it started on Wednesday. Oh, it was confusing uh, well, last Wednesday. Okay, I'm sorry for that. Okay, that's it for today. Thanks a lot for uh, attending. And uh, till next Wednesday or till next Saturday, for those who cannot attend Wednesday, let's all always... 
Great lesson. Thanks a lot and have a nice weekend, everyone. Have a nice weekend too. Remember to eat pasta, cook pasta.